the FLCC. My name is Izzy Grooms, and I am one of the professors here. I teach nutrition here at FLCC, and we would like to welcome you to our big day. That actually uh, gave me chills a little bit, and I've talked to a couple of you, and I said, I never really cared about the eclipse, and I never really cared about Mars until I started listening about the eclipse and Mars, which you'll hear Tim McConaughey uh, talk about. I thought, well, now I care. So I'm so glad you are all here. So welcome to FLCC. Uh, we're going to take some time to explore today's phenomenon for a variety of angles before the eclipse begins shortly after 2 p.m. Just so you know, and I'll give you a couple of updates as we go, but Mexico is going to be in totality right at 2.07. So if you want to stick around in the auditorium before you go up to the turf field to see totality in Mexico on the big screen, feel free to do that. And I will remind you as we go along. To our first-time visitors, thank you so much for joining us. Let me share some information about FLCC. We are part of the State University of New York. Our mission is to empower our students to succeed and fuel the cultural and economic vitality of the region. We offer a wide variety of education and training services to the residents of the Rochester Finger Lakes region and beyond. This includes two-year transfer programs for those who want to go on to get a bachelor's degree. For those who don't want to wait four years to join the workforce, we offer two-year applied degrees and one-year certificates and short-term training in everything from healthcare to paralegal to information technology. We also offer cultural programming like today's event because we know that learning is a lifelong endeavor. And there's always more to know. I actually live by a couple of mottos in my, uh, in my life, and one of them is if I can learn one thing every day, then by the end of my life, I'm going to be super, super smart and kind of waiting for that day. Not waiting for the end of my day, but waiting to be super smart. But nevertheless, what I hope today is not only maybe you learn one thing, but maybe you learn 12 new things. And it really is going to be a great day. We want to have a good time. We want to be relaxed. We want you just to enjoy. There's all kinds of things going on on campus. Obviously, you've seen the schedule for today, but very quickly, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we have going else around campus. Uh, we have an incredible uh, uh, visual performing arts uh, creative art program, and so we do have an art gallery downstairs on the first floor. And I've said to many of you, anyone you see that has a name tag, Feel free to ask them anything you want about our college, anything that's going on today. If they don't know the answer, they can certainly find somebody to uh, help you with it. But uh, that art gallery is downstairs. We have an eSports team, which is actually pretty impressive. Uh, the eSports team, in the past two years, the eSports team have achieved 20 national playoff appearances and two national championships. A little like the South Carolina basketball team that you watched last night. They are phenomenal, I'm telling you. And if anybody's going to stick around long enough to stay, uh, or not to stay here, but to watch the, uh, the, the men's game tonight. But our eSports, just as exciting, I would almost guarantee you, as the Iowa LSU game. Maybe it's going to be 12.5 million viewers for our eSports. But they are going to be gaming today. And they are going to be, you can watch them they're going to build a replica campus complete with Eclipse in Minecraft, and you can watch them uh, just outside the auditorium doors in our student lounge. Stage 14, many of you already looked around stage 14. When you come out the doors right to your right at the end, there's tables, there's chairs. That will be the, uh, the, NASA, the NASA programming. There's also some games there. There's some coloring. You know, maybe you'll be in the art gallery the next time you're here with your excellent coloring, wherever Katie is. There you are, Katie. Yep, I saw you. It was really good work. Uh, there are, and again, there's, there's all, just a place for you to relax. Student Lounge, we have the uh, Saunders Finger Lakes Museum. We have Eclipse Ambassadors. So if you have any questions at all for them, they'll be there from 10 to noon. We have coffee, drink, snacks available in the cafeteria for lunch because, you know, your stomachs might start growling because, you know, you came up early. Uh, you had, uh, to, when you paid, you got tickets to lunch. There's a soup and sandwich bar from 1030 to 2, so feel free to go anytime your stomachs start to rumble. Uh, one, Kelly Govan is one of our professors here, and her husband has offered to do guided trail tours, so you can just meet right downstairs on the first floor. 10, 11, 4, and 5. We'll talk about the turf field later. Uh, after the event, so Star Cider 
some of you, if you're not familiar with uh, this area, Star Cider is a cidery that's kind of on campus. It's not on campus, but we feel like it's on campus. It's that close. So there is a CMAC. So CMAC is a, a large musical venue that is here on campus as well. And the parking lot is called Lot G. Lot G is just down, uh, you know, a quarter of a mile or less. Star Cider is right, uh, right there, right off the parking lot. And after the whole day that we're going to spend here, they are having music and they're having food. So you've all seen the signs, haven't you? Come early, stay late. So uh, feel free to head down to uh, Star Cider and enjoy your time. Uh, many of our speakers today are going to be hanging out in stage 14. Again, we're going to be super relaxed. We want you to enjoy. If you have questions, feel free to ask them anytime you want. Uh, again, if you learn one thing new, that would be great. If you learn two things new, if you learn 12 things new, that would be even better. Then you're a little bit closer to being super duper smart with the end of the day. On that note, I am going to introduce you to our special guest. Um, Tim McConaughey is a local research scientist with a doctorate in astronomy from Cornell University. Talk about smart. Uh, he will be our guide during the total solar eclipse. Tim currently studies the atmosphere of Mars, primarily through remote sensing from spacecraft in Mars orbit and from rovers on the Martian surface. He is a 1994 graduate of Pittsburgh Sutherland High School. He studied the solar corona while a student at Williams College, where he graduated in 1998 with a major in economics and astrophysics. He then worked as a research assistant for the Board of Governors for the Federal Reserve System and the technical staff at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory before attending graduate school at Cornell University. Tim was a NASA postdoctoral fellow at the Goddard Space Flight Center and then continued to work for them as a University of Maryland research associate an assistant research scientist. He now works for the Space Science Institute and resides right here near Rochester. So we like to welcome Tim. We're so happy he's here. We did a little uh, dress rehearsal or a, 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 a rehearsal prior to this. And like I said to you, prior to hearing about the eclipse and prior to hearing about Mars, I kind of thought, well, it's all right. And then when you start hearing about it, it was really exciting. So. Thank you so much for coming. We're so glad you are here. If there's anything we could do for you at all, you just let us know. Uh, we are here to enjoy ourselves just as much as you are here to enjoy yourself. And I will be with you throughout the day. So if you have any questions for me, don't hesitate to, to reach out. And uh, on behalf of FLCC and the Finger Lakes region, welcome to our program. Welcome to the Big Eclipse Day. Yep. This doesn't come around very much, does it? They're once in our lifetime chance. And Tim McConaughey, thank you so much, and I'll see you soon after Tim's talk. Have a wonderful time. Enjoy. There we go. Thank you, Izzy, for that very kind introduction. I have lots of things I can talk about, probably more than I will have time to talk about, so I will jump right into it. This first talk is all about what to expect at the eclipse uh, and what it means, sort of scientifically. Um, later on, I have a talk about Mars, uh, but for now, we'll stick to uh, the Earth and the Sun, um, mostly the Sun. So this image right here is from the 2017 eclipse. Um, and uh, you'll see a lot of these images like this where it's actually, we've take, they've taken multiple images and sort of added them together and stacked them up so you can see the time lapse of how, um, how the, the, the sun, view of the sun changes over time. But we will not see it just like that. Uh, this eclipse was with the sun rising in the east. So through the magic of computers, I can just flip this around. And for us, it will look sort of like this. Um, right before uh, the moon first goes in front of the sun, well, the sun will look like this. And you can see it will gradually take a bite 
out of the sun. You probably all heard about this until we get to totality. Some terminology. First contact is when the moon first touches the sun. Fourth contact is when the moon last touches the sun. Second and third contact, that's the main event. That's when the moon totally covers the sun, and then when it stops totally covering the sun is third contact. So what's happening here is basically because the moon is orbiting the Earth in the same direction that the Earth rotates, it's setting slightly more slowly um, than the sun is setting. And so the sun catches up to it um, as it falls uh, into the west, which leaves the moon to be uh, passing in front. Something else I'll point out is during, during second and third contact, I mean, during totality, um, totality is the time between second and third contact. There will be uh, plenty of stars visible. Um, most prominent will be Venus, um, just below the sun, and uh, Jupiter, a couple two hand widths, a couple hand widths uh, above the sun, along along the same track here. Uh, other stars will be visible. You know, it turns out you can actually see these even in broad daylight if you know where to look. Um, but they'll be very, they'll really stand out for you uh, during the eclipse. So what is going on here? I think most of you have probably seen these diagrams, but by a cosmic coincidence, uh, the moon is uh, just the right size to completely block the sun, um, but only barely. Um, so basically, when the moon in its usual orbit happens to wind up between the sun and the Earth, um, there is a small spot on the Earth, for example, right here, uh, where the moon is entirely covered. And you can see that the moon is orbiting in the same direction the Earth is rotating. And again, that's why it catches up um, as they are both setting. Uh, and you may be wondering, how come this doesn't happen every month? And the reason is that the two reasons. The main reason is that the moon and the sun are in different planes. So the Earth's rotation uh, is sort of in one plane, and the moon's orbit is tilted relative to that. So it just, they just sort of have to line up at just the right time when the plane of the moon and the plane that the sun is uh, um, effectively uh, in uh, happen to coincide. And then in addition to that, this orbit is not exactly a circle. Um, so that changes the distance, so that's why sometimes you can get an annular eclipse where the moon is not big enough to cover the sun. So um, if you look at the sun through telescope during an eclipse, you can see something like this. Uh, most important right here is these little sunspots. Those will become important for understanding what the corona looks like. Um, and I suspect the NASA live feed will show some telescope shots like this during the day. Here's, here I am labeling the sunspot. This bright spot of the sun that is visible every day, even though you shouldn't look at it, we call that the photosphere. More about what that is later. But during, during the partial phase, there are some interesting things you can do. Uh, these are sort of like interesting experiments that teach you about optics, really. Uh, if you poke a little hole in a piece of paper or create some little hole in uh, some other way, you'll actually be able to see an image of the sun um, on anything you can find. Um, a white piece of paper works best. Uh, so that is something I really recommend trying. If you have something with a whole bunch of holes, for example, some leaves in the trees, not that we have any of those today, but if you did have leaves in the trees or a colander or any other object, you can see multiple little images of the sun projected. All right, now let's talk about the main event. So you'll be looking at the main event through your eclipse gases, um, uh, waiting for totality to occur. And what will be happening is, you know, as we approach the moment, and I think we'll be able to have a countdown on the uh, stadium clock, by the way. But as we approach the moment, uh, you'll see the sun shrinking down to this, a little sliver. And then these horns will start to rapidly contract. Um, you might see some shimmery lights called shimmery, shimmery shadows, essentially, uh, called, called shadow bands. Uh, also looking for those after third contact. These will shrink down. And right before the eclipse, again, we're still not looking with our naked eye at the sun. Um, it'll shrink down to a point or a little bar. Uh, in pho photographs at this point, um, people with cameras will be pulling their filters off 
and with some long exposures, they'll actually be able to see the, the corona peeking out um, while this one tiny patch of the sun is still here. This is called the diamond ring, uh, ring effect, by the way, which is just sort of a you know, descriptive of what it looks like in a photograph. So we'll shrink down to this bright sort of point or bar, and then right before totality, this is not totality yet, we have little bits of light uh, peeking out down valleys uh, on the moon's limb here. These things are called Bailey's beads, and this is a matter of a second or two uh, before the sun is totally covered. We'll see those things. Um, still, we're not looking this, at this with our naked eye. We might see a little tiny point of light through your eclipse glasses. And then, when it gets totally dark through your eclipse glasses, you're pulling your eclipse glasses off, and you will see the solar corona. Uh, and this is the main event. Here are the times. We have about a minute and, um, I forget, about two minutes, 40 seconds or so of, uh, of totality. Uh, and uh, images, I mean, this is a pretty accurate picture of what it looks like, but does not really do justice to what you see um, um, in person or what the experience is in person. Um, and I suspect the corona will be actually a lot spikier and patchier than this right now. Uh, this is from 2017. Um, we're in a very active phase of solar weather, so this will be even sort of spikier, most likely. Um, other thing to look for, well, okay, there'll, there'll be some stars here to look for, um, bright planets along this line, uh, but also lots of other stars will be out. Um, well, also, you should expect to see the sun, sky get brighter away from the sun, um, and there should be a sunset um, all around, we'll see a 360 degree sunset. Um, and this means, by the way, that you're gonna wanna be um, up high as, we, as you can be uh, during totality. Actually, I, I forgot to point out, another thing we'll see as a totality is approaching, as I expect, um, if the weather is clear enough, we should see the shadow approaching us from the hills to our southwest. Um, so as totality gets very close, ideally, We'll get as many people as we can up to the top of the bleachers uh, to see, uh, see the hills to the southwest. So we should see the shadow approaching that way. And then during totality, uh, you'll see more of the sunset the higher you are. So again, being up high will probably be a good idea during the eclipse. And as I mentioned previously, uh, you should be able to see uh, Venus here, Jupiter up here, and maybe, I kind of don't think we'll be able to make Mars and Saturn out. There, there will not be very bright. Uh, they'll be close to the horizon, and you know, I bet we'll have some patchy clouds here. So they're there. Probably won't see them though. Okay, so this is the end of the show. This is the end of the game. This is game over, basically, for totality. When you see these things appear, as soon as you see these bright spots, which are called Bailey's beads, by the way, um, as soon as you see these, that means it's time to put your glasses back on. I'll be calling it out. Um, but you do get a brief little glimpse of these before you put your glasses back on. That the, the, the you know, half a second of seeing these is not gonna hurt your eye, but, but any, any significant amount of time is too much for looking at those. So you got your glasses back on right away. Um, whoops, gotta back up here. Okay, so now that I've sort of explained what you'll see, Let's switch to talking about what, what we're looking at. Like, what, what, what is this pretty picture actually showing us about, about, about the sun? Um, and so I'm stopping on this because we see bits of the three main layers of the solar atmosphere that are in play during the eclipse. So these little bright spots here and this, this is what it'll look like, you know, right, uh, right as the eclipse ends. So the eclipse is ending. These bright spots here, those are the sun's photosphere. Photosphere is a part of the sun we see every day, the bright disk of the sun. Um, we see this photosphere peeking out here, and then this pinkish glow is the chromosphere, 
which is a layer of cooler gas just above the photosphere, which you don't normally see because it's very diffuse and cool and actually, actually also super thin. That's the pink. Um, this thing called the prominence, uh, we may have a good shot. These are really part of the, the, chro the chromosphere, um, but because of solar activity, they get sort of launched up high above the edge of the sun. Um, so we may see these for the entire entirety of totality, but they'll, they're pinkish, and the fact that they're pinkish tells you that they are essentially the same temperature and same sort of gas as the chromosphere. Um, and then this uh, hazy stuff, this sort of spiky, fuzzy, hazy stuff, um, is the uh, is the corona, and the corona is really the the main event, but. Let's talk more about those layers. So here's the photosphere. There are the sunspots I mentioned before. Um, they come in clusters. Um, they are sort of the source of all the activity that we see, the upper layers. To study the other layers, layers of the sun when we're not in an eclipse, we use a space telescope. We look in UV light at different wavelengths. Uh, different wavelengths of light pick out different layers and different temperatures in the atmosphere. Um, so this particular wavelength uh, picks out the chromosphere, which is that cool layer. And we see that where we have sunspots, we seem to have some sort of activity going on uh, in the chromosphere. And then we go to, all right, I forgot about this. Um, I should have mentioned, but here is the Earth for scale on the sun. Um, you can barely see it on my computer screen. I think if you're close to it, you can probably see it there. Um, it's about the same size as a sunspot, um, uh, as, as one sunspot, not an entire, not, this, is an entire this, no, this is an entire group of sunspots. It's about one sunspot, one good sized sunspot is about the same size um, as the Earth. All right, yes, another point I wanted to make about the physics of this. Um, again, the bright area of the sun that we see every day is the photosphere. Basically, it's called the photosphere because that is where most of the photons come from. Um, it's just diffuse gas. Even the photosphere is just diffuse gas. Um, but the photosphere is where that diffuse gas gets thick enough so that we can't really see past it anymore. Okay, that's all it is, just where the, 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 the diffuse gas um, there's enough of it that we can't see past it anymore in that photosphere. Above that is this super thin, cool layer called the chromosphere. Um, and that layer is actually, you know, it's about um, a tenth of an Earth diameter thick, this layer of the chromosphere. So there's the Earth. The chromosphere is like smaller, narrower than my pointer, okay, along the limb. And then above that, above the chromosphere is the corona. And in the corona, you can see this temperature plot here. The corona is super, super hot. That's one of the, the fundamental mysteries of coronas that sometimes we can study during eclipses is how the corona gets so hot when the energy has to get to it through this cool layer. We all know that energy likes to flow from hot to cold, right? Um, so somehow the energy manages to flow from cold to hot to get to the corona. And that's sort of a, a, a fundamental puzzle um, in space physics and solar physics, which is a puzzle that's important for every, every star in the universe. Um, so the corona is super hot. So here's the corona. Now, I've sort of, to make things more interesting, we've used three different colors of ultraviolet light to pick out three different temperatures in the corona to make a spectacular um, kind of bizarre picture which is showing us where all the active regions of the sun and how all those active regions sort of come together to make this bizarre, spiky picture. Um, um, incredibly structured gas that is, is the corona. And um, the question you should be thinking about in your mind right now, which I'm gonna answer soon, is how does the corona get all that structure? How does it get so spiky? Like, how do we get from this diffuse gas all over the sun to this very uh, uh, spiky stuff that is the corona? So here's a 
just another view of the corona, and I can put that into animation. This is one particular temperature, one particular wavelength of light in the corona. So we'll be seeing this. Uh, what's really going on in the sun is this. And you can see these streamers emerging um, from all of the active regions of the sun and evolving in time. It's almost, let me go back, show you that again. Uh, I really want to see that image again. Come on, I want the video again. There we go. It's almost, to me, it's almost sort of creepy how all these spidery features are sort of wheeling around. But this, this is every day, this is every day uh, in, in the life of the sun. Um, this is a, this video here is a less of an everyday thing, uh, but it does happen routinely where the sun blasts out material from the corona. Uh, and all those little bright spots on the camera, that's what happens to electronics um, when one of these bubbles of gas from the corona uh, reach, reach them. So this is really space weather. It's sun weather or space weather. And an important point here is that Really, the corona that we're going to see today with our naked eye for as a very rare opportunity um, extends through the entire solar system. Essentially, the corona is so hot that the, the atoms in the corona reach escape velocity, and they stream outwards through the solar system, um, affecting all the planets and all the atmospheres of all the planets and all the satellites, all the artificial satellites, and all the natural satellites around all the planets. So, how does, all, how does all this activity in the corona happen? Um, well, it boils down to uh, magnetic fields. Every one of these sunspot groups is like different poles of a magnet, and that magnet field, magnetic field arises in the sun uh, just like the magnetic field arises in the core of the Earth. You have a fluid that is churning around, and that fluid is conductive. In the case of the sun, it's conductive because it's a super hot gas. Um, in the case of the Earth, we have a conducting layer because it's molten metal, but in the sun, it's a super hot gas. Um, that flowing gas um, generates a magnetic field. And in the case of the sun, because it's all a gas, it's rotating at different speeds, different places, and that starts to wind up the magnetic field. Just like if you've probably you've seen a rubber band, if you take a rubber band and you start twisting it, it makes all these sort of funny loops. Uh, the magnetic field in the, in the sun does the same thing. It gets twisted into loops in complicated shapes because it's being twisted by the rotation of the sun. Uh, and because it's twisted like that, it sort of pops up into, the, into these sunspots. Uh, it makes sunspots because that magnetic field interferes with the motion of the gas, which sort of prevents heat from reaching these areas, and so it makes them cold. Uh, but that magnetic field, let's see, I have more things about the magnetic field. So you can think of magnetic field lines as going from one sunspot to the next. So that magnetic field then also pops up above the photosphere, um, creating loop structures uh, like this. So here's, for example, a group of sunspots in visible light, and then emerging from those sunspots are these arcs of magnetic fields and the gas is trapped in the magnetic fields and make, makes loops like that, which we can see in ultraviolet light. So what that means is that we can think of the corona as kind of like a bunch of iron filings around a magnet. Many of you have probably seen this experiment done. You take an ordinary bar magnet and you sprinkle some little bits of conductive metal, iron, around it, and those bits of metal um, they line up with the field lines and show you where the magnetic field is. Well, because uh, the corona is so hot and so thin, um, it's so hot and that makes it conductive and that means that it's, um, that means that the magnetic field lines prevent it from flowing except along those lines. So the magnetic field basically traps the gas of the corona. So all these structures we see in the corona Hopefully you'll see them well with a naked eye today. All those structures are basically tracing the field lines, the magnetic field lines 
um, in the solar corona, just like the iron filings do um, in a magnet. Okay, um, and one of the interesting things that happens in the sun with a magnetic field is um, that magnetic field, um, it breaks down. So just like if you, you've probably all seen a spark happen, right? For example, you know, you get a whole bunch of static by walking in the carpet and scuffing your feet. Um, you get enough charge, um, then the resistance that was preventing that charge from sparking breaks down and you get a spark. Or you've all seen lightning. Again, we get a big static charge and then it gets big enough um, the energy gets released. Well, it's way more complicated with magnetic fields because it's, it's all twisted. Um, magnetic fields are sort of more complicated geometry than basic static charge. But the same thing happens. It gets too strong. Um, it breaks down, and you get a big release of energy, and that tends to launch material away from the sun as well as emit a whole bunch of x-rays. Uh, and all those things have interesting effects for the entire solar system. Um, and this movie that I showed you before is an example of one of those interesting things that happen uh, that the magnetic field uh, can do when it gets active and it breaks down. Um, it launches events out into the solar system, and those events are very important for the evolution of everything in the solar system. Um, for example, uh, these blasts of energy from the sun, um, like you're seeing replaying here over and over, uh, they reach the atmospheres of planets, uh, and they tend to erode them, essentially. They're a bunch of, basically a bunch of particles smashing into the atmosphere, and they knock some of it away. So that affects the evolution of planets um, and their atmospheres, which we'll talk about more later with Mars. Um, it also tends to damage spacecraft and even, even electrical, electrical grids on the ground. And most exciting, or maybe not as exciting as a power outage, but still pretty exciting, um, solar activity um, lights up the skies for us, so we're going to be in a very active phase of solar activity for the next year or two, um, so we'll be having great op opportunities to see displays like this, um, which are caused by essentially the solar corona um, being active in launching blasts of plasma out towards the Earth and other planets. This, things like this happen on other planets too. And that's all I have to say about the sun for now. We may have time for like a quick question, I think. Uh, also, I will be in the green room, or whatever the room stage is called. Stage 14. Yeah, stage 14? Yep. Stage 14, yeah. So over that way, there's a big sort of room with lots of windows. I'll be hanging out in there if you have more questions. But I think we have time for a quick question now, if anyone has anything. Otherwise, feel free to, just come feel free to come talk to me. Of course, I like to talk about this stuff. In case I see a big hand waving, otherwise big I'll hand. talk to you. All right. Was anybody counting how many new things they learned? I know. I stopped counting after like 10. But I, I expect you all at some point in time when you see me throughout the day, be like, ah, I see 20, like 25. So, uh, so he'll be around, like uh, Tim said. So uh, stage 14 is down at the end. He'll be hanging out. So feel free again to reach out and ask. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, John Bateman. John Bateman is going to talk on the totality causes of calamity for our nocturnal wildlife. Uh, he teaches many of our wildlife-related courses uh, that teach students how to identify and work with wildlife. He also teaches environmental science. So one of the beautiful things about working here is we're a fairly small campus, and you really do get to know people. And uh, you have opportunities to work with each other in committees. And uh, the one time that I worked with John was just recently. I don't know how we had the conversation about, well, let's smash something. Like, don't you want to smash pumpkins or something? as, a, as, a, as a, uh, a charity event. So we have a local uh, farmer's market, and we 
emailed them and talked to them, and we said, you know, could we pay you for the pumpkins that you have left over? And she said, sure. And so John and his uh, kids, I think his son, went to pick up a whole bunch of pumpkins, and we had pumpkin smashing out on the front lawn. Now, when I tell you to watch John wield a big sledgehammer, it was pretty impressive. In my head, when I was wielding that sledgehammer, I thought to myself, I look like I... I watched a video of myself. I literally looked like this. So very different pumpkin smashing, but what it does when we're all together is it makes such a neat connection. And I'll give you a couple other connections as we go with other, our other faculty, but John is something special when it comes to wildlife. Uh, he may not say he's an expert, but he really does know a lot. So uh, again, thank you. And this is John Bateman. Thank you all for coming out today. Appreciate you coming to Canadagua to share this once in a lifetime event with me. Uh, as Izzy said, I'm John Bateman. I am a wildlife scientist by trade. Uh, my expertise is in herpetology, so the study of amphibian and reptiles. But I've done a ton over the years with birds, small mammals, and invertebrates as well. And you know, I came up with a catchy title, but I'm really going to be talking about you know species that are active during the day, those that are active around sunrise, sunset, and the nocturnal ones that the solar eclipse is definitely throwing you know a, a bit of a challenge at them and how they respond to this this change in their environment. So I want to talk about some of the factors that an eclipse has on these environmental factors, things that it influences. And it's, it's more than just sunlight here. So yeah, photo period is the big one that I'm going to be focusing on, you know, the, the incoming solar radiation, but also the impacts on temperature, on wind, both wind speed and wind direction, on humidity, and potentially, and I know you all don't want to hear this, but cloud cover can even be impacted by uh, solar eclipse during totality. So with photo period, basically the eclipse from that first partial eclipse through totality and then the second partial eclipse, it's kind of resembling dusk and then twilight and then dawn. With temperature, and this can vary quite a bit, but we're looking at usually about a four to a 10 degree uh, drop in temperature during that period of totality. In some cases, even more so when it went through the Carolinas, I think it hit about 14 degrees cooler. Uh, with wind, we see uh, approaching totality that there is a drop in wind speed, a reduction of about a mile and a half, but in some cases, I've read of a study in Indonesia where it's about seven miles an hour slower. And also the direction of the wind changes, that it shifts about 10 to 15 degrees more easterly. And basically what's happening is this cool air mass underneath the moon's shadow almost creates a spinning vortex. So you have this you know, the, the warm air that's surrounding it. And typically when air warms, it wants to rise and it's unable to do so. And also with this drop in temperature, we see changes in humidity. So cold air isn't able to hold as much uh, moisture, water vapor as warm air is. So as temperature drops, we see, you know, kind of like a negative correlation that the amount of humidity in the atmosphere goes up. And then with cloud cover, it is possible during the eclipse to have some low-level cloud formation, though at least with me right now, fingers crossed that we don't see that. So I mentioned that the eclipse in Indonesia in 2016, this was a cool figure that, that shows graphically what's happening with air temperature, humidity, light intensity, and with wind speed. So let me point out a few things on here. So. The first contact, the start of the partial eclipse, happened at about 7.27 in the morning. Totality here lasted about two and a half minutes between 8.37 and 8.40 in the morning. And then by 10 o'clock, the eclipse was over. So let's look at temperature and incoming solar radiation, which those two are related to one another, right? The sun is sending us energy. So we see after that first contact, this drop in air temperature matched up with this you know, decrease in incoming solar radiation. Here's that spike in humidity that I talked about. So once again, that cooler air. So as air temperature drops, we see that humidity is on the rise. 
And then that little bit of decrease in wind speed as we approach totality. Should mention on here, just as a baseline, they have these four variables, temperature, humidity, light intensity, wind speed, in that dotted blue line the day before, just to kind of show you what, uh, what a normal day would look like and, and what happened on that day of the eclipse. So how do wildlife perceive an eclipse? So what is going on in their mind in terms of light conditions? So for them, realize that, uh, that the day is more or less broken up into a, a four period time for them between like dawn and then daylight, dusk at the time when the sun sets, and then the evening. And this basically sets like a biological clock for them. They have what's called circadian rhythm, basically how an animal perceives like the length of one period of day versus circannual rhythms, things that set basically a help with their biological clock and help them know when to breed, when to migrate, or like something around here like a woodchuck. When is it the time of year to fatten up before it goes into hibernation? And species have adaptations to help with when they are active. So in terms of species that are active during the dawn and dusk, we call those crepuscular. Uh, they're active around half an hour before sunrise until about half an hour after sunrise, and then half an hour before sunset until half an hour after sunset. Diurnal species are those that are going to be out active during the daylight, and then nocturnal species, those are ones that are out at night. And I'm painting with a broad brush. They, there is no one that fits, you know, really entirely under these, these categories. And even by season, some of these can change. So, like, Black bear, which are around here, don't worry, you're probably not going to see one when you're up on the, on the turf field, but we see that this time of year, black bear are typically active during the day. When black bear are around people, though, you're going to find that they are crepuscular, so they are raiding your bird feeder or your garbage can, you know, before you wake up in the morning or when you're getting ready to go bed, to bed at night. With white-tailed deer, this is one by season, so springtime. White-tailed deer tend to be more crepuscular, so they're active around sunrise, sunset. Summertime, they're diurnal, and if you live in upstate New York or surrounding areas, you know that when fall hits, that basically when, when the rut comes, it's 24-7, right, and they're trying to dodge cars. And species have adaptations for when they are awake and alert. Probably the biggest one with the vertebrates are receptors in your eyes. In the back of the retina, we have cones and we have rods. So cones are responsible for picking up color, and rods are responsible for uh, receiving light. And if you're a diurnal species, you're going to have a higher proportion of cones, especially right in the back of your eyeball, and your rods are going to be around like the periphery of your eye. That's why if you go out at night and you try and look directly at a dim star, you have a hard time seeing it, but you'll see around like the edge of your vision um, many, many stars, and then they kind of disappear when you go to, to look at them. And the opposite with nocturnal species. So nocturnal species are going to have uh, much more uh, rods in their eyes as opposed to the cones, um, but their vision isn't going to be great. Probably the exception there is going to be bats, and especially fruit bats, where they do have uh, a lot of cones, ones that pick up the color red, and that's something that helps them figure out where ripe fruit is. Uh, as well as like eye size. So when I do work with squirrels, occasionally I catch um, flying squirrels in my gray squirrel traps. And they have huge eyes, right, that are going to absorb as much of that ambient uh, light, moonlight and starlight as possible to help them navigate in the evening. All right, so as far as what an eclipse is doing to wildlife, once again, like how they are perceiving it, from that point of first contact, when the sun and the moon hit and we start to get that the start of the eclipse basically that is resembling dusk that we are going to for a period have uh, a decrease in the amount of sunlight this is going to trigger crepuscular species once again those active around dawn and dusk to become active to get out and be ready it's going to drive diurnal species uh, to start to become dormant so they're going to stop feeding foraging and, and get ready for you know what they think is nighttime is coming and then with nocturnal species, this is when they are going to start to stir. At totality, 
Right, so we have a minimum amount of solar radiation coming in, and it's mostly scattered solar radiation from around the area of totality, as well as that bit of light that we're getting from the corona. It, it's not quite, you know, true night, or maybe it's more, you know, similar to a, a night of a full moon. Uh, but this is where we see a lot of confusion among species, that they really aren't sure quite what to do at this point because it's not truly night. And then this is followed after totality by a period where the amount of sunlight coming in is increasing, which basically resembles dawn. So we'll get, once again, crepuscular species are going to kind of slow down at this point. Nocturnal species are going to become inactive. And those diurnal species, the ones that are typically active during the day, are getting ready to uh, become active at this point. So man, I think it was last September that I got the invitation to give this talk, and, and wildlife is just something near and dear to me, as well as sharing information that I have. And I've never given a talk like this before. I probably never will again, right? This is truly once in a lifetime for everyone. But, and, I, and I love learning. I, I just want to know as much about wildlife as possible. So this is something I was not going to pass up. Uh, for my review, you know, I don't go to social media, I don't go to news stations. I'm going to like peer-reviewed scientific literature, looking at, you know, what is considered like the tried and true um, stuff that is considered scientifically valid. Um, but let me say, with an eclipse, uh, it's really missing two fundamental pieces of the scientific method. And that is, we cannot control all of the factors out there. And that is true for natural studies as it is, but even more so with an eclipse, and repeatability. And science is all about repeatability. Can you do it again and again? Or can somebody else do what you did in another area or at a different time and get the same results that you did? When is there going to be another eclipse on April 8th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in upstate New York? <laughs> right? I, I think I read the, the probability of it is about 360 years just to have another one at that same place let alone even during the same season, right? And, and just like this is our first solar eclipse, this is the first solar eclipse for all of the wildlife out there. It is their first and their last. So a lot of what I found was kind of like anecdotal evidence, just people, and, and this is largely coming from astronomers, and I hope Dr. McConaughey is not out in the field, or maybe he can do earmuffs for a second. Um, they're not there to see wildlife, right? During a solar eclipse, they are there for totality. And I think a lot of these records came from astronomers who maybe were not in ideal conditions with high cloud cover, not what we're going to see today, right? And they said, oh, okay, well, this bird's doing something a little bit different, so let me write this down. Um, and there's bias, too. So once again, I'm not you know, trying to fire a shot at astronomers. How well do they know wildlife behavior? How well do they, uh, how well can they identify wildlife species. So some of the stuff, uh, I, I think it needs to be paired in with my knowledge of natural history and do the two kind of jibe. Uh, with bias amongst observers, I'm going to talk about an eclipse that happened not too far from here, up in New England back in August of 1932. And, you know, if you tell people in the public, hey, there's a solar eclipse coming, we think that it's going to impact wildlife's behavior. Will you record your observations and send, it as, send that in to us? I think that kind of gives them the assumption ahead of time that wildlife are going to do something strange. And we get what are called a priori assumptions. Um, so things to just to keep in mind when I start talking about you know, some of the findings, especially from that 1932 eclipse. All right. So from past eclipses, I, I found records going back to the 16th century, kind of like the end of the medieval period to like modern times. Uh, I think 1544, uh, somebody talking about, you know, birds being more active towards totality. Uh, record from the 1560s about birds falling in the sky, which I really, I, that one just does not make sense to me one bit. Uh, but it's this landmark paper, this key paper, 1932, uh, the eclipse, once again, this kind of went through uh, the northeast part of Vermont, down through Maine, a lot of like the farmland through Maine, and then it just caught northeast Massachusetts. There were five professors from this area who got together, and they decided they wanted to make a big citizen science project. And they advertised 
in like the Boston Globe and the Boston Herald and the Christian Science Monitor. They were, they were on radio, and, and some of you young folks might be like, Why, what's radio anymore, right? Like they didn't have TVs back then. That's how they had to advertise this. Uh, but man, they got more than like 500 responses from folks, and they were able to use about 90% of them. They considered those to be scientifically valid, uh, and I'm largely going to be focusing on those over my next few slides when I talk about how wildlife respond, because it's species that you've probably heard of before that are from this area. And with more recent eclipses, especially the 2016, 2017 ones, man, the, the literature, it, it's starting to pile up now. We're, we're learning more and more, and, and scientists are doing data collection in a much more scientifically sound way, putting meters out ahead of time, capturing sounds, being able to quantify these things, setting insects traps. So I'll, I'll touch on those a little bit. All right, so insect behavior, and I'm going to focus at the start on nocturnal species. So I'm going to talk about crickets, I'm going to talk about, everyone wants to hear about cockroaches, uh, katydids, and same thing. This happened in August, right? We're not going to hear katydids in, in upstate New York in, in April. Uh, moths, and then the other one you probably really didn't want to hear about is mosquitoes. So with crickets, this is one where I think there's a lot of validity to this. I have pretty good faith in this that uh, there were just dozens, I think upwards of five or six dozens reports of crickets um, calling leading up to totality during that first partial eclipse and basically peaking at totality. And this is one that, I've, same thing, I found this in like more historical records prior to the 20th century. Um, cockroaches, there was, there was one report of this, and I just had to throw this in here. I, I found it kind of humorous that uh, this observer basically said, Madam, I believe you have a cockroach infestation problem in your pantry that, you know, he was in her house, totality hit, and these cockroaches came from, from the shadows going after her food. Um, Katie did, like I said, we, we, we're not going to hear those today, and this is another interesting one. And, and like I said, kind of people trying to... Uh, you know, put a purpose behind what they, they heard. They said that the katydids, that they were, they started calling during totality. And then after totality, like one would call here, one would call there. And, and the observer said that it was almost like they were ashamed that they started calling, I think was what, what he put on there. Uh, moths, this is another one where we're going to see an increased presence of these um, leading up to and then following totality. Uh, I think they brought up the Miller moth in particular here. And this is one, 2016, 2017 studies where they've set light traps and have found that it is, you know, it indeed seems to be true that the moths are uh, coming out, approaching that totality. And the mosquitoes, another one that I've seen again and again and again. Drop in temperature, rise in humidity, and decreasing sunlight basically resembles evening time, which is when most of these mosquitoes are going to come out from their hiding places, out of the grass, and try and take their blood meal from you. So be on the lookout for these this afternoon. Good chance. Well, we are in an artificial turf field. Maybe it won't be too bad up there, but if you're in the woods with me, we'll have to watch out. Uh, so for diurnal species, what's going on with these species? So we see that there's an increase in activity of diurnal species leading up towards totality in honeybees. So these records, once again, like I have pretty good faith in these, even though they were from the 1930s, because they came from apiarists or, or beekeepers. I think beekeepers are, are pretty familiar with what bees should be doing during the middle of the day. And what they found was as totality approached, like there was a mad dash among bees to get back to the hive, where the hive would basically just be just covered, inundated with these honeybees trying to make their way back. And basically no bees were going out during that time. And it almost seemed like after totality that the bees were really hesitant to go back out again. This threw them off a bit. Bumblebees, this is another one. There, were, there was one record here where an individual said he's out, you know, watching the eclipse, and he gets struck by a bumblebee. The bumblebee just falls to the ground and just, you know, lays there like a slug, essentially. And after totality, it got up, pretended like, you know, hey, no one was looking, right? And then just got off and, 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 and went about its day. And these are key with me, important to me, because bees actually use the sun for navigation. Where the sun is, um, 
to help them figure out where they need to go. So the sun disappearing and the bumblebee, which, you know, are not, you know, colonial species like the, the honeybees are, I could see where this would cause some confusion for them and why it would just kind of sit there and hang out until the, the sun came, until the sun came back out. With these responses with insects, let me just say, these are largely reflexive. They don't have, you know, the, the thinky, thinky parts of the brain that, that you and I do. If something changes in the environment, they're going to alter their behavior based on that. Um, with cicadas, once again, we're not going to hear cicadas, though it's going to be a phenomenal year from what I've heard. I think at least two broods are emerging this year. Going to be almost like plague-like out there. Uh, that They saw that there was an increase in calling, and then basically calling ceased at uh, totality. And then with butterflies, that so they disappeared even before the eclipse started and then showed up about 45 minutes after uh, totality. All right, amphibian and reptile behavior. This is the one I was really looking forward to, like I said, with my, my background, especially with uh, the frogs. So I, I, I should point out here once again, it, it was interesting to read kind of the interpretation from these, these five authors on this paper, and I think they used the words deplorable and abhorrent that there was just no knowledge of what amphibians and reptiles did during the day. Like they recognized that there was this huge gap in like the scientific literature and they, and they said, even we don't know, like is this, is this normal? Is this not normal for those species to do that? Um, me, I'm a little more well-versed in that. So, you know, I can definitely share some, some insight. So with frogs, they noticed a few things. Uh, one was that toads were present throughout the eclipse. Once again, this is 3 o'clock in the afternoon in August. Uh, people saying that frogs were out, or, or toads were out eating worms and, and crickets in their garden, and one observer said, more or less like a toad came up, sat next to him for like the eclipse, and then went back into the woodlot. Once again, I, I, I don't know if I really trust that one. Uh, people talking about an increase in spring peepers calling, which there's a very good chance we will hear spring peepers calling out in the woodlot today, as well as tree frogs. Um, but these three things, like it's not uncommon for toads to be out during the day. Toads have a rougher skin covering compared to most of the amphibians where they have more moist skin. They don't need to worry about drying out. If there was any kind of cloud cover or humidity, that's reason enough for a toad to go out and find a meal. And same with the frogs calling. Yeah, most frogs call in the evening, but not all of them. Once again, if there's a chance to try and find a mate during the day when your neighbor isn't, you know, the, the frog is going to take advantage of that. One thing that I found out of a, uh, a paper from 2017 from that eclipse that I felt was, you know, biologically significant uh, was bullfrogs. And they brought up bullfrogs moving their position within the pond, that essentially they started staging. And that's one that makes sense to me. Bullfrogs are more of a nocturnal species. So as totality approached, like the, the, the bullfrogs were coming from like the deeps of the pond up towards the edges to go out and get ready to hunt. With the reptiles, so I'll talk about snakes and turtles. Uh, there was a report from a zookeeper that python activity was starting to increase. Like they, they were becoming alert. They were leaving their... Um, leaving like their, their home structures, and pythons are nocturnal. Once again, that makes sense to me. Uh, from the 1932 study, there was a report of a garter snake that looked like it was well-fed or had recently fed, uh, that it possibly ate during the eclipse. Um, trust me, I've, I've spent many, many hours watching snakes consume prey. It usually takes about an hour and a half to two hours for a garter snake to eat something like the size of a toad. So I, I think this was just, you know, by, by, by happen chance that this happened. And then this one, oh, this got to me bad. A uh, water snake, an observer said that a, a water snake emerged and started basking on the rocks about a half an hour prior to the eclipse and was there until 20 minutes after totality when the person shot it. <laughs> Oh, persecution among reptiles. Oh, it did. I wonder where we get it from. 1930s. And turtles. And this is one, like I said, I, I am hoping to look for this today because this is another one that makes sense. So the amphibians and the reptiles, the, the scientific word for them is they are ectotherms. The, the bad word that's kind of used, is kind of ran its course in science is cold-blooded. Uh, the turtle shell is alive. Turtles in the morning have to go out onto logs and rocks and bask, and that live shell is taking in that sun's energy. It's heating its body, giving it the energy it needs to go back into that cold water to find its food. 
they saw with turtles, like 95 plus percent of them, as totality uh, approached, they went back into the water. And basically, immediately after totality, as the sun started to come back out, the turtles returned to the logs. Like I said, I, I know that sounds minor, but as someone where, with the amphibians and reptiles being so near and dear to me, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to possibly seeing this today, as well as totality. Birds. Birds was an interesting one, and I'm not going to lie, this, this confused me a bit, and I think I've wrapped my head as to what's going on kind of biologically with them. But with birds, we saw changes more at the individual level. One bird would be doing one thing in the same species, and another one would be, would be doing something different or, or not acting abnormally. That you would, I would have thought you would have seen one species responding one way to the eclipse and another species acting differently, but all in all, that was really not the case. Uh, with this in mind, there were numerous contradictions. Same thing, that, that some people were seeing some sort of abnormal behavior, almost like panicked you know, kind of state. Once again, if we were to kind of put you know, human conditions, emotions on, on an animal, that they had that kind of behavior. And there was note across the board, though, that the birds that seemed to be affected by the solar eclipse, that it took longer for them to return back to uh, their normal behavior. So general trends that we saw, um, a decrease in foraging. Once again, we would kind of expect this similar to like mammals. If, if they are expecting nighttime is coming, it's time to stop feeding. Uh, this is a significant one to me. So an increased calling leading up to the eclipse, and then more or less the birds becoming quiet at totality, and then an increase again after totality during that second partial eclipse. And so I, I've done bird monitoring for years and years and years. I did this on a big EPA grant. Bird monitoring is usually done half an hour before sunrise for about four hours, and then four hours before sunset up until about half an hour active. They are very active, willing to produce calls and songs at the start of the day and at the end of the day. So birds calling leading up to the eclipse and then increase in calling after the eclipse, once again, kind of biologically makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, and then there were a handful of nocturnal species that were observed here. I'll bring up a couple owls and that, but getting into like the specific, you know, species behavior. So looking at nocturnal species like owls, they did record eastern screech owls calling. Uh, they did talk about barred owls calling eastern whippoorwill, which is another nocturnal species. There were numerous reports about uh, common nighthawks migrating, but this is in New England and this is in August. That's around when they begin their southerly migration. So once again, the presence of common nighthawks migrating out, I, I, I don't think that necessarily can be tied into the eclipse. Looking at diurnal species, and once again, this isn't like all of these species. This is individuals within these species. We saw crows starting to roost, starlings, uh, various gull species, red-winged blackbirds, house sparrows, and then there were a couple notes of blue jays, which are very vociferous, basically quieting down at totality. Now here's a figure from a, a paper from the 2017 eclipse, the one that went uh, basically from Oregon down through the Carolinas. And this observer, Mendoza, this is from Western Field Ornithologist, he recorded the number of bird calls and songs at 10 minute intervals, and then he had to switch 20 minutes leading up to totality uh, to five minute intervals because of the amount of calls that were happening. But here we see as totality approaches, man, the birds get going. This is kind of like their evening chorus. As the sun is starting to set, these birds are producing songs and calls. Totality hits at zero. And it's not like it totally shut off. There's still birds that were calling, but definitely a pretty significant drop there from that, that peak here right before totality. And then once again, after totality, we see kind of what resembles like a dawn chorus in them. Moving our way on to mammals, and I'll talk about nocturnal mammals. I'll talk about diurnal, and I'll also touch on some that are kind of on the diurnal crepuscular side. Once again, nocturnal, active at night, diurnal during the day, diurnal crepuscular, kind of around sunrise, sunset. Yeah, I'm teaching you all some vocabulary, too. Uh, 
skunks, there were, once again, this is like just a handful of reports. Skunks coming out from the woods into people's lawns, rooting for like insects, grubs, and such. Totality hits, the skunks go back. Uh, bats, this is another one that historically what I've seen is you know, almost every eclipse that people are documenting wildlife that they are seeing um, bats out and active. Uh, once again, a nocturnal species, this kind of makes sense. Uh, but this is only within the zone of totality. As soon as you get to 99, 98%, there's, there's no bad activity. It just has to be within that path. For diurnal species, and we have a whole lot of these, I think I captured 11 of these last Thursday in one of my class, all but one of them pregnant, uh, gray squirrels, that as totality approached, that they stopped feeding, that they stopped, and same thing, they're, they're, they're putting the word that the squirrels were playing in return to uh, their drays. And then with white-tailed deer, there were reports of them going out and foraging, both in fields at apple orchards uh, during totality. So kind of to summarize, like, like what am I taking away from all of this? I, I really think the insect records, especially with the bees, the crickets, and the mosquitoes, uh, those make sense. And once again, insects, it's more of a, a reflex to a change in the environment that there's not thought involved in this. Uh, with the amphibians and reptiles, once again, kind of a mixed bag because a lot of what they thought was unique behavior is, is not uncommon to see those species doing that during that time. The turtle one, though, like I said, with them, where they stopped basking and then returned to bask after totality seems legitimate. That matches up with their natural history. Birds seem to be freaked out. I mean, to, to put it in layman's terms. And, and so, like I said, I've been trying to wrap my head around this, and I think what's going on is, you know, insects, amphibians, reptiles, they're not known to be like deep thinkers, right? Think reptilian brain. Uh, it, it's more reflexive responses on them. And I think with the birds that they're going more off of their internal 24-hour clock. So when they see that the sun is essentially starting to set and it doesn't match up with when it usually does, that's what freaks a number of them out. And also that outside of that zone of totality, no difference in bird behavior. And then finally with mammals that some seem to be more affected than others, and honestly, from what I've seen in the records, the mammal that is most affected by totality are all of you, as opposed to the wildlife out there. So what should you look for today? Obviously, this is the eclipse, right? Spend your time watching totality, the time approaching, the time afterwards, but keep your ears open. Listen for that kind of evening chorus followed by the dawn chorus with the birds see that quiet moment at totality, uh, potentially hearing some nocturnal insects. I wouldn't be surprised for some crickets to be calling if you are outside. But once again, this is April in upstate New York. The insects really aren't out and about yet. Um, squirrel and deer behavior, we do have those here. Once again, if you're near kind of the wooded areas, you may hear or see some of this going on. A lot of the species that probably would historically be affected by an eclipse, uh, species that are nocturnal or crepuscular, they just had their babies not all that long ago. The end of January, February is breeding season for a lot of the medium-sized mammals, uh, so I would not expect to see changes in their behavior. And then I've got my sources for you. So I know I'm probably a little tight on time, but I do look forward to hanging out in the uh, stage 14 afterwards. So feel free to come up to me if you have any kind of questions. Thank you. All right, what are you up to? How many new things have you learned? All right, it's a lot, right? It's a big day for us, big day. So uh, for our timing to stay on our timing, uh, I'm not going to read Tim's uh, whole biography that I did a few minutes ago. So I'm just going to bring Tim back up and let him talk about uh, the atmosphere of Mars, which I know I said this prior to listening to Tim. I thought, Wah, Mars. Now well, listening to Tim, I'm thinking, oh, Mars. So thank you again. Uh, and I'll see you in just a few minutes. Okay.
and there we go. So following up on that previous talk, I just want to say I don't really think of myself as an astronomer. I really think of myself more as a, a planetary scientist. Um, although you may be looking at this and thinking this may be a talk about rocks. And it really sort of is a talk about rocks because the story of a planet is most easily told by looking at the rocks. Because even though I'm most interested in the atmosphere, um, to figure out what the atmosphere is doing or was doing a billion years ago, much less four billion years ago, we have to look at the rocks. And so the geologists tell us what they see in the rocks, and they say, oh, the climate must have been like this. And then the atmospheric scientists say to the geologists, no way. Like, that wasn't happening. We can't think of any way for that to happen. Um, and that is sort of the story of the Martian climate in a nutshell right there. It's the rocks telling us one thing, and then the atmospheric scientists, which is more what I think of myself as, as an atmospheric scientist, um, trying to figure out how, how could that be possible how does that make sense? So what we're looking at here is uh, sedimentary rocks on Mars. Uh, sedimentary rocks that tell a story in layers. Each layer is a little chapter of the story uh, of what the environmental conditions were like at some time on Mars. And then planetary geologists have some tricks to figure out, OK, I see these rocks. And I, I don't yet have a sample in my hand to do some uh, radiocarbon, radioisotope dating on them. Um, how old was that? And uh, the answer is that this turns, this is probably a 4 billion ish years old, and it's telling us part of the story from 4 billion years ago of what Mars was like. And this is what Mars is like now, by the way. You see, even Mars has clouds. Um, uh, these are water ice clouds. Um, what Mars does not have is total eclipses, though. All right. So in those 2.4 billion trips around the sun for Mars, there have been about 4.5 billion trips around the sun for Earth. And a large part of why the story of the Martian climate is interesting is that we don't have a nice record of rocks from four billion years ago on Earth. So if we want to know what the solar system was like four billion years ago, if we want to know how planets were evolving when the solar system was only, say, a half billion years old, uh, Mars is sort of the best place to do that. Uh, and this picture here, this is from Earth from, from not far away in uh, uh, Saratoga Springs. Um, this is part of why what was happening four billion years ago is so interesting. Uh, these are stromatolites. Stromatolites are fossilized uh, mat made by algae. So algae forms colonies, and they make these sort of mats that I imagine look gross if you saw them in real life in a lake or, um, or uh, an estuary or something like that. Um, but they leave behind these formations in rock and they are telling us about some of, the, some of the earliest forms of life on Earth. And there's only, a, I think these are probably typically are like three and a half billion years old on Earth. Um, and they're telling us about some of the very earliest forms of life, but we have so few of these and pretty much nothing from four billion years ago that if we want to understand the early stage of, of an evolution of a planet that might lead to life, uh, Mars is kind of one of the best places to go to figure that out. So this talk sort of has two parts, two parts of the story, two stories really. One story is how did we humans work this out about Mars? And I'm getting, gonna give you a very brief version of that story. Um, and then the other story is what actually happened. And so first I'm gonna tell you the story of how we, how we got here in terms of how humanity thinks about Mars and then I'm going to tell you the story of what we think actually happened uh, based on what we figured out so far. So I like to tell the story of human thinking about Mars uh, from here, uh, from the late, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, where our telescopes weren't really very good yet. 
and we were looking at Mars through the Earth's atmosphere, which made things very confusing. Um, but, but in the late 19th century, people thought of Mars, started, were starting to think of Mars as a planet like Earth, and sort of assumed it would be Earth-like. Um, and so when they saw shapes on the surface of Mars, they gave them labels like water and land and shallows um, and made maps like this. And then, you know, later on, Percival Lowell is famous for drawing pictures on Mars, uh, drawing pictures of Mars from what he saw through a telescope and making lots of straight lines out of these pictures and arguing that these were evidence of uh, some kind of civilization. So that's where, that's where things sort of kicked off in the modern era of, of human thinking about Mars. So fast forward to the space age, um, and the beginning of the space age on Mars, when we first sent uh, a spacecraft to fly by Mars, um, things sort of got turned on their heads where we saw something that looked pretty much like the moon. Um, a uh, friend of mine used to taunt me by saying that Mars is little red and dead, and that's certainly what it looked like uh, when Mariner 4 flew by. It was just a whole bunch of craters, um, and this is just a flyby, so we just sort of flew on by. We didn't go into orbit with this spacecraft, although there's sort of a hint here that something more interesting was going on on Mars, um, although this is what's stuck in people's head, all these craters like the moon. Um, there's a whole bunch of haze here, and that haze is really the atmosphere of Mars being actually pretty active in reality. Um, another thing it showed us is that, uh, that the pressure, surface pressure of Mars, which until then had been a wide open question, Mariner 4 showed us that there was only about four to seven millibars. Now, um, a millibar is called a, called a millibar because a thousand of them makes up one bar, which is about the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere. So pressure of seven millibars is uh, seven-tenths of one percent of the Earth's atmosphere pressure. So that's not enough air for you to breathe, not enough air even for you to survive if you have like, you know, a breathing mask or anything. That pressure is so low that just like that dramatic scene from Total Recall, your blood will pretty much boil, although it won't look exactly like that scene. But anyway, it will be very unhealthy for you to be exposed in the Martian surface. Okay, so things got more interesting um, when Mariner 9 went into orbit of Mars. Actually, when Mariner 9 first arrived, we could see nothing. The entire planet was obscured by a haze. But as that haze cleared, um, we started seeing volcanoes, which is a sign of geologic activity, uh, and lots of um, sort of rift valleys as well, also a sign of geologic activity. We saw networks of valleys. So a network of valleys is formed by a river, right? So where's my pointer? Where'd it go? Really, where'd it go? Hmm. Oh, never mind. I know, I, I know my trick. Okay, there we go. Don't put your fingers in front of the pointer is how it's the trick there. Um, so, um, so this is sort of a fan shape of tributaries uh, forming a river here. So that certainly suggests flowing water on the surface of Mars at some time. And um, we can count the craters. Because we went to the moon, um, because we had humans on the moon, and we could bring back rocks and date those rocks, and then we can count the craters on the moon, we can figure out um, how many asteroids were flying around in the solar system at any given moment in time and get a rough idea of how old the surface is based on how many holes there are from craters. Um, so you can figure out that these are four plus billion years, these surfaces are from four plus billion years old. So very long time ago in Martian history, there was flowing water. And this was sort of the first sign of that, which has become sort of almost like gospel for NASA that Mars uh, four billion years ago, four plus billion years ago, was apparently a wet place. Uh, here's another piece of exciting evidence that is t telling us really about a cataclysm of some kind, because these are huge features, huge streamlined features, which tells us that a huge quantity of fluid flowed that way, um, probably a massive outbreak of water from somewhere. Um, 
And this is more recent. This happened more recently than these value networks formed, by the way, based on greater counting. Okay, so uh, next stage here, um, the Viking era. Um, Viking era is when we first tried uh, to detect life on the surface of another planet. And at that point, we were really just not very good at it, trying to detect life. Um, we really didn't understand biology in extreme conditions well enough to do this properly. So we detected, oh, sorry, jumping ahead, shouldn't. we detected um, activity in the soil. Like you add some things that should be nutrients or water to the soil, and something happens, active chemistry happens in that soil when you add water. Um, but there were no organic molecules so, so the conclusion was, okay, so these soils are active somehow, but there's nothing organic. Uh, apparently there is no life. Although there is, are a few people sort of, um, there are a few iconoclasts out there who think that life was detected, but that apparent life was probably just the, the active soils, uh, which is actually something that is sort of part of my research currently, what, those, what that soil activity was. Um, but that's not really the topic of my talk today, so you can talk to me about that in person if you like. Okay. Um, <coughs> skipping ahead some more, and I realize I'm, I'm skipping some, some Mars missions, of course, for those of you who are um, close, of, who've read the story of Mars very closely, you'll notice I'm skipping some things. Um, jumping ahead to, there was a very long gap, you've probably noticed, between the early 70s and next time that NASA managed to get a, uh, a spacecraft to Mars successfully. Um, but what we started seeing in, uh, from the Mars Global Surveyor mission was layered rocks, so sedimentary rocks. And the sedimentary rocks, as you know, not made by volcanoes, um, but laid down by basically erosion and flowing water or wind on the surface, um, putting sediment down. and telling, and by putting sediment down in layers, they provide a much, a sort of a, a fine, a more finely detailed story of, of what was happening than you can just by looking at some, some volcanic lava flows. Um, and they also strongly suggested that there was a long era of uh, basically atmospheric activity um, that was available to put down these rocks. You don't have to have water to lay down sedimentary rocks, by the way. You can do, you can create sedimentary rocks just by wind blowing stuff around, but it certainly kind of suggests that there might have been water. Um, this picture on the right, on the other hand, this you cannot do with wind. Uh, this is a, a delta. This is a river delta of some kind. This sort of structure is a classic type of shape made by a river delta. And to get a delta, you have to be flowing into a body of standing water. If there was no standing water here, you'd get a different shape of, of landform. So this was sort of pretty much a smoking gun for lakes at some point in Martian history, pro probably in that you know four billion or more than four billion year ago time frame. So, Eventually, uh, we sent a rover to, I'm skipping some rovers, you probably noticed. Uh, eventually, we sent a rover to a place uh, where we found some, where we were able to study up close and personal um, these sedimentary rocks uh, that had been tantalizing us for, for 20 years. Um, and uh, what we found in those sedimentary rocks was Biosilicates, which is basically clay or clay minerals, um, in very fine grain sediments. And to, to drop down super fine particles, you need standing water. If it's not standing, if it's flowing water, you end up with sand. Um, but if you have standing water, you can put down super fine particles, which sort of generically called mudstones. Um, and then the chemistry of those rocks tells us basically the pH and some other details of that water, and it shows us the, the pH was actually pretty friendly for life as we know it. Um, and on top of that, we found organic molecules in those rocks. Um, so that led us to be sort of more excited about Mars as a story of a place where life could have formed. Even if, even if it didn't form, it started to look like a place where it could have formed, um, making 
the Mars story, again, sort of more interesting. Um, at least if you feel that you need life to make something interesting, it certainly made Mars more interesting. So, um, again, skipping a bunch of missions, but most recently, and this is something I've been involved with um, lately, uh, is the Perseverance rover. And for the Pers Perseverance rover, we went to another spot where we had evidence of standing water. In this case, this is a delta. Um, in this image, we've actually sort of taken some, some black and white image data, and we sort of put that on top of a topographic map to make sort of a shaded 3D picture of what it looks like. Um, so we went to this river delta. Uh, we landed uh, right around here, actually. We ran, landed right around here, we drove around here, and then we drove it back around here, and then up the delta. Um, and uh, the main ob objective of this is to get samples to drill cores, uh, little, little, little tiny rock cores that are about yay big, and yay thick, uh, and pack them up so that eventually, if everything goes well with funding uh, from Congress, um, we will we'll be able to get those back in the, sometime in the 2030s. <laughs> and once we get them back, we can do all kinds of techniques that are not really possible in the kind of things you can launch to Mars. Um, with current technology, like do um, you know radioisotope dating, um, look for very small quantities of things because evidence of life will be you know sort of tiny amounts of certain molecules. Um, so we really to do that best, we need Earth-based laboratories to see the way it works is to see a tiny amount of something. You need something very very you need a very very massive instrument. So if you want to see a tiny amount of something, it's very hard to launch that instrument to Mars. When you need to see a tiny amount of something, you really want to bring it back. Excuse me, can I ask a question? Um, why don't we hold the questions until, you know, another, uh, maybe about 10 minutes, I'll be done. Does that sound good? Yeah, please, please hold that thought for me. Okay. Okay, so what that, leads us to is sort of the kind of canonical story, canonical story that, that we tell about Mars, and I think it is possibly an exaggeration, but also mostly true. Um, the artist's depiction that we see uh, is that there is a possibility that Mars had lots and lots of water four plus, years, four plus billion years ago, at the same time that life on Earth well, even possibly, possibly a half billion years before life on Earth was really even getting started. Uh, we had a very Earth-like, potentially an Earth-like climate on Mars, um, leading to the creating of artistic renditions of a blue and beautiful Mars. Um, and then leading us to ask not just, okay, could life have formed there, but also how do we get from this to this? Um, and I think it's pretty clearly proven, scientifically speaking, that Mars, ancient Mars, four billion years ago, was definitely a lot warmer and a lot wetter uh, than it was now. It was clearly a lot wetter, and it must have been at least somewhat warmer to have some standing water. Uh, uh, it's very tricky for the atmospheric scientists to explain how that's possible uh, because actually the sun was a lot fainter even uh, four billion years ago than it is now. So how do you get the climate to do that? Um, you need a whole lot of greenhouse warming, basically. You need a whole lot of greenhouse gases for any planet to be, to be warm and hospitable like Earth. Um, and it's hard to figure out uh, the chemistry and the, um, the science of and the physics, really, of how to get Mars that warm. Uh, but it seems like it probably was pretty warm somehow. I'm not really going to not, I'm not really gonna answer for you the question of, like, how did we get the right mix of gases to make it that warm, or what exactly that mix was, because you don't really know. But what I will tell you, what I will tell you about is how we got from a Mars with a whole lot more gas in the atmosphere there's one way or another you need a lot more gas to make it warm. Um, 
and a lot more water would make it warm. So what I will be trying to show you is how we lost all that gas and lost all that water and where it went. Um, so, so how did this happen? Uh, and I'm gonna tell you a story like many stories backwards. Um, I'm gonna start from the end of the story uh, because when you're trying to do science, you start with what you know. And what we know is what things are like now. Um, so that's why I'm starting at the end. And the end of the story is Mars right here. And because this is what I study, I'm mostly studying Mars here and now, as opposed to ancient Mars. Uh, I have lots of slides about this, but I'm gonna go through them fast because we don't really have time to go talk all about Mars as it is now. Um, but basically, here's Mars to scale relative to the Earth. You may remember the Sun and Mars, the Sun and Earth to scale uh, from before. Well, now here's Earth relative to Mars. So compared to the Earth and the Sun, Earth and Mars are really a lot alike. Um, they rotate at about the same period, um, but very importantly, it's only 10% as massive, and that turns out to make all the difference in terms of how it evolved. Um, here's some more details about the Martian climate. I'll skip this for now. We can talk about this in the uh, stage 14 or, or in the questions if you like, but bottom line is now Mars, is, Mars is, has a thin, dry, and cold atmosphere, uh, not enough pressure, and not warm enough uh, for liquid water to really be stable uh, anywhere, at least on the surface. I'll just point out that there's here the, here's one of the polar ice caps of Mars. Mars has some polar ice caps which are pretty important for its climate, uh, just like Earth has a nice polar ice cap here, also important for its climate. Um, and the other thing to know about Mars, as it is now, is it's full of rusty dust. Um, and this is silicate dust. Um, which is probably pretty bad for your lungs as well. Uh, it's one of the reasons we're studying it so much is that it's probably very bad for people's lungs if they were to go to Mars. Oh, and by the way, that this rusty color of Mars is that reddish color is basically the rusty dust giving it that color. So Mars, as we know it right now, is actually a fairly interesting place weather-wise if you go to the right spot. Um, this is sort of a windy day on Mars um, and we caught the dust lifting in action. And dust lifting is basically a fancy term for kicking up dust. And kicking up dust, because the dust is so important to the Martian climate, basically the sand, the dust storms are really the main weather on Mars. Um, catching it, Mars in action, uh, was very exciting to us, which is why I was so excited that I had to show you this video. So that's one video of Mars, Mar modern Mars in action. Here's another video of modern Mars in action. This is another style of dust lifting. Instead of a straight line gust, you get vortices forming. Uh, you, if you've ever been to Arizona and driven around, you've probably seen these in action. I like them so much, I wanna play that again. See if I can do that. Huh, it's not playing again for me. All right, let me back up. Okay. Play again for me. No, it's not gonna play again for me. If I click here, there we go. Thank you. All right. You all are sort of I just like to watch it again because it's sort of inspiring. Okay. So, so that's sort of a modern Mars atmosphere as we sort of see it in sort of human-like terms from the surface. Um, it turns out that to tell you the story, the evidence for where the atmosphere went on Mars is really much higher above the surface and the place where the Martian atmosphere is interacting with the solar wind, or in other words, the solar corona. Um, and what we see is sort of a halo of hydrogen atoms um, around Mars. This is sort of Mars in here. Uh, we also see a whole bunch of oxygen atoms sort of lower down. Oxygen atoms are lower down because they're heavier. They're a lot more massive, so they're not moving as fast, um, so they don't sort of spread out quite so much. So this hydrogen cloud, kind of, around Mars is basically the atmosphere of Mars leaking away into space. Uh, because it's hydrogen, it is mostly the 
water that is leaking away this way, because of course a lot of um, most of the hydrogen on Mars is actually locked up in water normally. So basically, water leaking away um, after being split into hydrogen and oxygen is what this is. Um, so this is a sign uh, that we're maybe onto something with how the planet loses its atmosphere. Um, and uh, to understand all that, to really tell you, to really make the whole story make sense, um, sort of hang together, mathematically speaking, or to work in your spreadsheet, as it were, um, you need to understand the entire system and because that's the kind of thing I get excited about. I showed you this whole slide here, which shows you all the kind of systems um, that are involved in the climate. So you can think of a climate of a planet as sort of this interlocking set of cycles. Now there's one cycle that we hear about a lot on Earth, which is the water cycle, right? We've all probably heard about the water cycle at some point in our schooling. You know, we know how that works. Basically, the water evaporates from the oceans. It spends some time in the atmosphere, and then it turns into clouds. The clouds get heavy, they rain down, and then they flow through rivers and back to the ocean, and the cycle repeats, right? That's the water cycle. But there are actually many cycles on Earth and on Mars that sort of fit together to create a balance which gives us the climate that we see. The other cycle we hear about sometimes is the carbon cycle. The carbon cycle on Earth is super important for determining how much greenhouse warming we have on Earth. We mess up the carbon cycle, we end up with a different amount of greenhouse warming, which may or may not be a good thing. Um, so on Mars, we also have cycles like that. Uh, there, in fact, is sort of a carbon cycle or a CO2 cycle, uh, which does indeed uh, determine the atmosphere pressure on Mars, because on Mars, at least, the carbon dioxide is spending some time in the polar caps and spending some time in the atmosphere. Um, and then in turn, the dust cycle ends up determining how much energy gets to the polar caps, which then affects the carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide cycle. There's also a water cycle, which determines the amount of clouds and also determines how much water vapor gets up the upper atmosphere to then escape into space. So all these cycles end up being part of a story of how that cloud of hydrogen we saw around Mars can add up to atmosphere escaping from Mars and having enough atmosphere escaping to try to explain uh, the change of the climate from warm and wet to, to cold um, and dry like we have now. Um, and the bottom line is it's actually very complicated. We don't really know, we can't really make the spreadsheet add up exactly, but we have some tricks that we can play um, to figure out what the main factor is in terms of losing the atmosphere. And one of the tricks is that there are some atoms that really don't do much chemistry-wise, so that their cycles are pretty simple and because our cycles are pretty simple, uh, we can look at what ha what's happening with them and make a simple spreadsheet where we can actually fill in all the boxes and know what happened. Uh, and in this case, it is argon. Argon being a noble gas doesn't do very much. Um, so um, we can look at uh, the argon in the outer atmosphere around Mars um, and see how it evolves. Um, and what we see from that argon in the upper atmosphere, and in particular, what we see from the different types of argon isotopes, some have more or less mass than the others, so the, the heavier ones tend to stick around, the lighter isotopes tend to escape. So we can look at the ratio of the different isotopes and figure out how much had to escape to give us the ratio we see. Um, and that tells us how much argon we lost, and it tells us we lost 65% of the argon to space. Um, so that means we probably lost at least 65% of all the other gases to space. And the main way that that loss happened is sputtering. Okay, that's just a fancy word for atoms from the solar wind slamming into the atmosphere and kicking stuff out. Okay, so 
We lost most of the mass of Mars by the solar wind slamming into the atmosphere and knocking it away. Um, and remember, the solar wind, this is the solar wind. What we're about to see today, if all goes well, um, will be the bottom of the solar wind. So there's a solar corona that's stripping away the atmosphere of Mars. Uh, it's also stripping away the atmosphere of Earth, but just to a lesser extent. So there's a whole bunch of details that I'm going to gloss through. Many cycles that I did beyond the one that I, uh, that I the, the simple slide I showed you before. Um, there's even more, and there's some interesting cycles about chemistry. Uh, it's one of my topics that I work on. Um, but other things, probably uh, things more complicated than carbon, things that are more complicated than argon, we probably lost more of them is the bottom line. And there are more cycles involved in those. But to summarize the story, to wind up here, let's first think about where the atmosphere came from. Um, the atmosphere came from volcanoes. All right. Um, Turns out that all the, the atoms and molecules that make up the atmospheres of rocky planets, they all, they all can be dissolved in rock. And then when the rock erupts from the surface, uh, those molecules like water and carbon dioxide escape from solution and end up in the atmosphere. Comets help a little bit. Um, and then mostly it gets lost because of the slower wind. And so, okay, so the story of a planet atmosphere is basically, it's provided by volcanoes, it gets stripped away by the sun, especially the corona, and then how much atmosphere you end up retaining after 2.4 billion trips around the sun or 4.5 billion trips around the sun all depends on how much mass you had to begin with because mass keeps you warm, lets the volcano stay active. Mass also makes it harder to knock the atmosphere away. So that, in a nutshell, is how atmospheres in the solar system evolve. Provided by volcanoes, taken away by the corona. And that's it. So now we have a little time for questions, I think. I know I had one question that was already, already got uh, on the list. So go ahead. Basically, the question is, have the volcanoes on Mars stopped? And I'm not a geologist, so be careful about, you know, do your own research, basically, <laughs> about this question. But it looks like they have probably not stopped entirely. Um, there has been definitely much less volcanic activity at the pres present time. But there is some hints of some volcanic activity within the past million years on Mars which is super recent. A million years is a very small amount of time compared to four billion years. Um, so it looks like there is some geologic activity still going on Mars. Uh, whether that's enough to help with the atmosphere at all, uh, no one can say. We don't know. We don't, because it's you know a million years ago, we can't really say how much very well. But there does seem to be some evidence of a little bit of volcanism still happening on Mars. But you know, all the huge volcanoes that we see are, are billions of years old. So it was definitely way more active volcanically in the past. I see one there. Okay. Go ahead. In your opinion, do you think our planet Earth is going to be assimilate the climate of Mars into our greenhouse gases? Uh, it's definitely not going in the direction of Mars. Um, being colder and drier. Um, greenhouse gases are tending to make, and the changes in greenhouse gases are tending to make the Earth warmer, and that makes the Earth more moist, meaning more water from the ocean ends up in the atmosphere. And actually, most of the greenhouse effect on Earth is caused by water vapor. And the carbon dioxide is sort of a small little, a little extra kick that sort of pushes the cycle a little, for, a little further towards more water, which provides most of the actual warning, warming. All right. All right.
And I'll be around more if you want to talk more. That's what I was just going to say. And remember, so Tim's hanging out. So again, stage 14, if you go out these doors and to the right down at the end, he'll be hanging out. So please, again, we want it to be a nice, relaxed day of, of, of learning. And if for those of you that have been here since uh, this morning, since I talked to you, how many are you up to? How many thing, new things have you learned? So again, to keep with our timing, I'm going to introduce three of our humanities uh, instructors, and they are going to do some readings. We have uh, something called Art Space 36 here in Canandaigua, and it was a creative art space for the community as well as FLCC to kind of come together. And they do all kinds of uh, creative processes. And on Friday night, they had a poetry reading and uh, there was a great uh, response from people. Um, we had our, our sign language instructor. She was there to do the interpretation of some of the poems. So I'd like to introduce our three uh, humanities uh, instructors. Uh, Meg Gillio, she is a professor of humanities. She teaches composition one, two, introduction to creative writing, as well as fiction writing workshops. We have John Palzer. John Palzer is the coordinator of our creative writing department. He teaches composition literature, introduction to creative writing, and poetry writing. And Maureen Moss Ferry, she is a professor and chair of our humanities department. She teaches foundational reading, writing courses, along with creative writing. And again, I will be back shortly. Remember, stick around for these three, uh, lunch, all kinds of other things happening, and I'll see you in a little bit. Thank you very much. going to step away from the science into the direction of science fiction. The story that I'm going to read an excerpt from is The Daughters of the Moon by Italo Calvino. He is an Italian writer and journalist, and this was first published in his novel Cosmic Comics in 1965, and then was later republished in 2009 in The New Yorker. The, the story begins with a scientific prologue. Deprived as it was of a covering of air to act as a protective shield, the moon found itself exposed right from the start to a continual bombardment of meteorites and to the corrosive action of the sun's rays. According to Thomas Gold of Cornell University, the rocks on the moon's surface were reduced to powder through constant attrition from meteorite particles. And so the story. The moon is old. Q agreed with this, pitted with holes, worn out. Rolling naked through the skies, it erodes and loses its flesh like a bone that's been gnawed. This is not the first time such a thing has happened. I remember moons that were even older and more battered than this one. I've seen loads of these moons, seen them being born, running across the sky and dying out. One punctured by hail from shooting stars, another exploded from all of its craters, and yet another oozing drops of topaz-colored sweat that evaporated immediately, then being covered by greenish clouds and reduced to a dried up spongy shell. What happens on the Earth when a moon dies is not easy to describe, but I'll try to do it by referencing the last instance I can remember. Following a lengthy period of evolution, the Earth had more or less reached the point where we are now. In other words, it had entered the phase where cars wear out more quickly than the soles of shoes. Beings that were barely human manufactured, bought, and sold things and cities covered the continents with luminous colors. These cities grew in approximately the same places as our cities do now, however different the shape the continents were. There was even a New York City that in some way resembled the New York familiar to you all, 
but it was much newer, or rather more awash in new products, new toothbrushes, a New York with its own Manhattan that stretched out, dense, with skyscrapers gleaming like the neon bristles of a brand new toothbrush. In this world, where every object was thrown away at the slightest sign of breakage or aging, or at the first dent or stain, and was replaced with a new and perfect substitute, there was just one false note, one shadow, the moon. It wandered through the sky naked, corroded, and gray, more and more alien to the world down here, a hangover from a way of being that was now outdated. Uh, ancient expressions like full moon, half moon, last quarter moon continued to be used, but they're really only figures of speech. How could we call full a shape that was all cracks and holes and that always seemed to be on the point of crashing down on our heads in a shower of rubble? Not to mention when it was a waning moon, it was reduced to a kind of nibbled cheese rind and was always disappearing before we expected it to. At each new moon, we wondered whether it would ever appear again. Were we hoping that it would simply disappear? And when it did reappear, looking more and more like a comb that had lost its teeth, we averted our eyes with a shudder. It was a depressing sight. We went out in the crowds, our arms laden with parcels, coming and going from the big department stores that were open day and night. And while we were scanning the neon signs that climbed higher and higher up the skyscrapers and notified us constantly of new products that had been launched, we would suddenly see it advancing, pale amid those dazzling lights, slow and sick. And we could not get it out of our heads that every new thing, each product that we had just bought could similarly wear out, deteriorate, fade away, and we would lose our enthusiasm for running around buying things and working like crazy, a loss that was not without consequence for industry and commerce. That is how we began to consider the problem of what to do with this counterproductive satellite. It didn't serve any purpose, it was a useless wreck. As it lost weight, it started to incline its orbit toward the Earth. It was dangerous above and beyond anything else. And the nearer it got, the more it slowed its course, and we could no longer calculate its phases. Even the calendar, the rhythm of the months, had become a mere convention. The moon went forward in fits and starts, as though it were about to collapse. On these nights of low moon, people of a more <clears throat> un unstable temperament began to do weird things. There was always a sleepwalker edging along a parapet of a skyscraper with his arms reaching toward the moon, or a werewolf starting to howl in the middle of Times Square, or a pyromaniac setting fire to the dock warehouses. By now, these were common occurrences that no longer attracted the usual crowd of rubberneckers. But when I saw a girl sitting completely naked on a bench in Central Park, I had to stop. Even before I saw her, I had the feeling that something mysterious was about to happen. As I drove through Central Park at the wheel of my convertible, I felt myself bathed in a flickering light, like that of a fluorescent bulb emitting a series of livid blinking flashes before it turns on fully. The view all around me was like that of a garden that had sunk into a lunar crater. The naked girl sat beside a pond reflecting a slice of moon. I braked. For a second, I thought I recognized her. I ran out of the car toward her, but then I froze. I didn't know who she was. I just felt urgently that I had to do something for her. Everything was scattered on the grass around the bench. Her clothes, a stocking and shoe here, the others there, her earrings and necklace and bracelets, purse, shopping bag with contents spilling out in a wide arc, and countless packages 
and goods, almost as if the creature had felt herself called on her way back from a lavish shopping spree and had dropped everything, realizing she had to free herself of all objects and signs that bound her to the earth, and she was now waiting to be assumed into the lunar sphere. What's happening, I stammered. Can I help you? Help, she asked, her eyes staring upward. Nobody can help. Nobody can do anything. And it was clear that she was talking not about herself, but about the moon. The moon was above us, a convex shape almost crushing us, a ruined roof studded with holes like a cheese grater. Just at that moment, the animals in the zoo began to growl. Is this the end? I asked mechanically. And I myself didn't even know what I meant. She replied, it's the beginning, or something like that. She spoke almost without opening her lips. What do you mean? It's the beginning of the end, or something else is beginning? She got up, walked over the grass. She had long copper hair that came down over her shoulders. She was so vulnerable, and I felt the need to protect her, ready to catch her if she fell, or to ward off anything that might harm her. But my hands did not even dare graze her and always stayed a few centimeters away from her skin. And as I followed her in this way past the flower gardens, I realized that her movements were similar to mine, that she too was trying to protect something fragile, something that might fall and shatter into pieces and that needed thus to be led toward a place where it could settle gently, something that she could not touch, but could only guide with her gestures, the moon. Thank you. I'm going to read a handful of poems that are either directly moon-related, loosely moon-related. And the first one is by the poet Ada Lamone, uh, the poet laureate, right now U.S. poet laureate, uh, who recently had one of her poems launched to the moon. So it's, it's sitting up there waiting to be found by whomever gets there next, I guess. But this particular poem is, is specifically about Europa, which is not our moon, it's the moon of Jupiter. So this is In Praise of Mystery, a poem for Europa by Ada Lamone. Arching under the night sky, inky with black expansiveness, we point to the planets we know. We pin quick wishes on stars. From Earth, we read the sky as if it is an unerring book of the universe, expert and evident. Still, there are mysteries below our sky. The whale song, the songbird singing its call in the bow of a wind-shaken tree. We are creatures of constant awe, curious at beauty, at leaf and blossom, at grief and pleasure, sun and shadow. And it is not darkness that unites us, not the cold distance of space, but the offering of water, each drop of rain, each rivulet, each pulse, each vein, O oh, second moon, we too are made of water, of vast and beckoning seas. We too are made of wonders, of great and ordinary loves, of small, invisible worlds, of a need to call out through the dark. Next, a poem by James Wright. James Wright was huge for me when I was a young guy. Uh, often one of the saddest people you can read, because when you're young, you're sad, I guess. <laughs> so, Beginning by James Wright. The moon drops one or two feathers into the field. The dark wheat listens. Be still. Now. There they are, the moon's young, trying their wings. Between trees, a slender woman lifts up the lovely shadow of her face. And now she steps into the air. Now she is gone, 
holy, into the air. I stand alone by an elder tree. I do not dare breathe or move. I listen. The wheat leans back toward its own darkness, and I lean toward mine. A poem called The Eclipse by Deborah Trussman. Birds nest at midday, chirp night songs in midday twilight, night without sunset, the sun noon high, bruised black by the moon. Charmed beasts dance to bells and flute, forgetting fear and fierceness, gentled bears and lions tamed for the length of a chiming, whistling tune. Strangers fall in love, a prince and a princess, parrots, planets perfectly aligned for three long minutes, as long as a song, until the sun heals white. Costumed parrots mock the wounds of magic. Strangers once more have lost the crown of the queen of false night. If there is a poet out right now that, you know, writing right now, who might actually uh, be someone more than a few people are familiar with, it's Billy Collins, who has managed to capture the popular ear with his poetry. And this is as if to demonstrate an eclipse. I pick an orange from a wicker basket and place it on the table to represent the sun. Then down at the other end, a blue and white marble becomes the earth. And nearby, I lay the little moon of an aspirin. I get a glass from a cabinet, open a bottle of wine, then I sit in a ladderback chair, a benevolent god presiding over a miniature creation myth. And I begin to sing a homemade canticle of thanks for this perfect little arrangement, for not making the earth too hot or cold, not making it spin too fast or slow, so that the grove of orange trees and the owl become possible. Not to mention the rolling wave, the play of clouds, geese in flight, and the Z of lightning on a dark lake. Then I fill my glass again and give thanks for the trout, the oak, and the yellow feather, singing the room full of shadows as sun and earth and moon circle one another in their impeccable orbits, and I get more and more cockeyed with gratitude. Paper sticks together. If Robert Bly were alive to read this poem, and he died just a couple of years ago, he would certainly make it more crazed than I am able to. He was quite a figure, uh, eccentric, and uh, the father of, so he liked to say sometimes, uh, the deep image poem, Trust in the Image. Seeing the eclipse in Maine, it started about noon on top of Mount Batty. We were all exclaiming. Someone had a cardboard and a pin, and we all cried out when the sun appeared in tiny form on the notebook cover. It's hard to believe. The high school teacher we'd met called it a pinhole camera. People in the Renaissance loved to do that, and when the moon had passed partly through, we saw on a rock underneath a fir tree dozens of crescents, made the same way, thousands. Even our straw hats produced a few as we moved them over the bare granite. We shared chocolate, and one man from Maine told a joke. Suns were everywhere at our feet. I chose two poets, Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath. I'm not even going to spend a second lecturing. If you're at all familiar, you knew that at the very least they had a, a tempestuous relationship. Uh, and I'm being kind. <laughs> Ted was not always the coolest guy, but here's uh, his poem, Full Moon and Little Frida. A cool evening shrunk to a dog bark and the clank of a bucket, and you listening. A spider's web, tense for the dew's touch, 
a pail lifted, still and brimming, mirror to tempt a first star to a tremor. Cows are going home in the lane there, looping the hedges with their warm wreaths of breath, a dark river of blood, many boulders balancing unspilled milk. Moon, you cry suddenly, moon, moon. The moon has stepped back like an artist gazing amazed at a work that points at him amazed. And here's Sylvia's. It's not a response, but maybe you could imagine it as one if you care to. The moon and the yew tree. This is the light of the mind, cold and planetary. The trees of the mind are black. The light is blue. The grasses unload their griefs at my feet as if I were God, prickling my ankles and murmuring of their humility. Fumy, spiritous mists inhabit this place. Separated from my house by a row of headstones, I simply cannot see where there is to get to. The moon is no door. It is a face in its own right, white as a knuckle and terribly upset. It drags the sea after it like a dark crime. It is quiet with the o-gape of complete despair. I live here. Twice on Sunday, the bells startle the sky, eight great tongues affirming the resurrection at the end, then soberly bong out their names. The yew tree points up. It has a gothic shape. The eyes lift after it and find the moon. The moon is my mother. She is not sweet like Mary. Her blue garments unloose small bats and owls. How we would like to believe in tenderness. The face of the effigy, gentled by candles, bending on me in particular, its mild eyes. I have fallen a long way. Clouds are flowering blue and mystical over the face of the stars. Inside the church, the saints will be all blue, floating on their delicate feet over cold pews, their hands and faces stiff with holiness. The moon sees nothing of this. She is bald and wild, and the message of the yew tree is blackness, blackness and silence. I agonized over whether I was going to eh, agonize this exaggeration. I wondered if I was going to re <laughs> read this poem. Uh, and, uh, but I'm going to. I, I just didn't want it to be misinterpreted as being uh, you know, thoughtless. And you might see why. This is Walt Whitman's When I Heard the Learned Astronomer. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I sitting heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. I'm going to guess that perhaps this is the most familiar piece. This is a poem called Eclipse by Roger Waters, lead singer and bass player of Pink Floyd. All that you touch and all that you see, all that you taste, all you feel, all that you love, all that you hate, all you distrust, all you save, and all that you give and all that you deal and all that you buy, beg, borrow, or steal. And all you create and all you destroy and all that you do and all that you say and all that you eat and everyone you meet and all that you slight and everyone you fight and all that is now and all that is gone and all that's to come and everything under the sun is in tune but the sun is eclipsed by the moon. Thanks.
nonfiction. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to read excerpts from an essay by great American writer Annie Dillard. It's called Total Eclipse. And it's, uh, she's writing about her experience of watching a total eclipse in February 1979 in Washington State. It was before dawn when we found a highway out of town and drove into the familiar, unfamiliar countryside. By the growing light, we could see a band of cirrostratus clouds in the sky. Later, the rising sun would clear these clouds before the eclipse began. We drove at random until we came to a range of unfenced hills. We pulled off the highway, bundled up, and climbed one of these hills. The hill was 500 feet high. Long winter-killed grass covered it as high as our knees. We climbed and rested, sweating in the cold. We passed clumps of bundled people on the hillside who were setting up telescopes and fiddling with cameras. The top of the hill stuck up in the middle of the sky. We tightened our scarves and looked around. Now the sun was up. We could not see it, but the sky behind the band of clouds was yellow, and far down the valley, some hillside orchards had lighted up. More people were parking near the highway and climbing the hills. It was the West. All of us rugged individualists were wearing knit caps and blue nylon parkas. People were climbing the nearby hills and setting up shop in clumps around the dead grasses. It looked as though we had all gathered on hilltops to pray for the world on its last day. It looked as though we, we had all crawled out of spaceships and were preparing to assault the valley below. It looked as though we were scattered on hilltops at dawn to sacrifice virgins, make rain, set stones steely in a ring. There was no place out of the wind. The straw grasses banged our legs. Up in the sky where we stood, the air was lusterless yellow. To the west, the sky was blue. Now the sun cleared the clouds. We cast rough shadows on the blowing grass. Freezing, we waved our arms. Near the sun, the sky was bright and colorless. There was nothing to see. It began with no ado. It was odd that such a well-advertised public event should have no starting gun, no overture, no introductory speaker. I should have known right then that I was out of my depth. Without pause or preamble, silent as orbits, a piece of the sun went away. We looked at it through welder's goggles. A piece of the sun was missing. In its place, we saw empty sky. What you see in an eclipse is entirely different from what you know. It is especially different from those of us whose grasp of astronomy is so frail that, given a flashlight, a grapefruit, two oranges, and 15 years, we still could not figure out which way to set the clocks for daylight saving time. Usually it is a bit of a trick to keep your knowledge from blinding you, but during an eclipse it is easy. What you see is much more convincing than any wild-eyed theory you may know. You may read that the moon has something to do with the eclipses. I have never seen the moon yet. You do not see the moon. So near the sun, it is as completely invisible as the stars are by day. What you see before your eyes is the sun going through phases. It gets narrower and narrower, as the waning moon does, and like the ordinary moon, it travels alone in the simple sky. The sky is, of course, background. It does not appear to eat the sun. It is far behind the sun. The sun simply shaves away. Gradually, you see less sun and more sky. The sky's blue was deepening, but there was no darkness. The sun was a wide crescent, like a segment of tangerine. The wind freshened and blew steadily over the hill. The eastern hill across the highway grew dusky and sharp. The towns and orchards in the valley to the south were dissolving into the blue light. Only the thin river held a trickle of sun. Now the sky to the west deepened to indigo, a color never seen. A dark sky usually loses color. This was a saturated, deep indigo up in the sky. I turned back to the sun. It was going. The sun was going, and the world was wrong. The grasses were wrong. They were platinum. Their every detail of stem, head, and blade shone lightless and artificially distinct as an art photographer's platinum print. This color has never been seen on Earth. The hues were metallic. Their finish was matte. 
The hillside was a 19th century tinted photograph from which the tints had faded. All the people you see in the photograph, distinct and detailed as their faces look, are now dead. The sky was navy blue. My hands were silver. All the distance hills, distant hills grasses were fine spun metal, which the wind laid down. I was watching a faded color print of a movie filmed in the Middle Ages. I was standing in it by some mistake. I was standing in a movie of hillside grasses filmed in the Middle Ages. I missed my own century, the people I knew, and the real light of day. From all the hills came screams. A piece of sky beside the crescent sun was detaching. It was a loosened circle of evening sky suddenly lighted from the back. It was an abrupt black body out of nowhere. It was a flat disk. It was almost over the sun. That is when there were screams. At once, this disk of sky slid over the sun like a lid. The sky snapped over the sun like a lens cover. The hatch in the brain slammed. Abruptly, it was dark night on the land and in the sky. In the night sky was a tiny ring of light. The hole where the sun belongs is very small. A thin ring of light marked its place. There was no sound. The eyes dried, the arteries drained, the lungs hushed. There was no world. We were the world's dead people, rotating and orbiting around and around, embedded in the planet's crust while the earth rolled down. Our minds were light years distant, forgetful of almost everything. Only an extraordinary act of will could recall us to our former living selves and our contexts in matter and time. We had, it seems, loved the planet and loved our lives, but could no longer remember the way of them. We got the light wrong. In the sky was something that should not be there. In the black sky was a ring of light. It was a thin ring, an old thin silver wedding band an old worn ring. It was an old wedding band in the sky or a morsel of bone. There were stars. It was all over. I have said that I heard screams. I have since read that screaming with hysteria is a common reaction even to expected total eclipses. People on all the hillsides, including I think myself, screamed when the black body of the moon detached from the sky and rolled over the sun. But something else was happening at that same instant, and it was this, I believe, which made us scream. The second before the sun went out, we saw a wall of dark shadow come speeding at us. We no sooner saw it than it was upon us, like thunder. It roared up the valley. It slammed our hill and knocked us out. It was the monstrous, swift shadow cone of the moon. I have since read that this wave of shadow moves 1,800 miles an hour. Language can give no sense of this sort of speed, 1,800 miles an hour. It was 195 miles wide. No end was in sight. You only saw the edge. It rolled at you across the land at 1,800 miles per hour, hauling darkness like plague behind it. Seeing it and knowing it was coming straight for you was like feeling a slug of anesthetic shoot up your arm. If you think very fast, you may have time to think, soon it will hit my brain. You can feel the deadness race up your arm. You can feel the appalling, inhuman speed of your own blood. We saw the wall of shadow coming and screamed before it hit. When the total eclipse ended, an odd thing happened. When the sun appeared as a blinding bead on the ring's side, the eclipse was over. The black lens cover appeared again, backlighted, and slid away. At once, the yellow light made the sky blue again. The black lid dissolved and vanished. The world, the real world began there. I remember now. We all hurried away. We were born and bored at a stroke. We rushed down the hill. We found our car. We saw the other people streaming down the hillsides. We joined the highway traffic and drove away. We never looked back. Thank you.
great. Thank you so much. A couple of announcements very quickly before I introduce our uh, next guest or our next speaker. So remember uh, that we've got our art displays downstairs. Uh, you can go into the atrium and they can tell you, give you directions. Uh, eSports, uh, in the past uh, two years, FLCC eSports have achieved over 20 national playoff appearances and two national championships. So you can see them building a uh, complete replica of the campus with Eclipse in Minecraft. Remember, stage 14 is a nice place for you to hang out. If you stick around at 2.07 here, before we go up to the turf field, Mexico is having their totality at 2.07, so we are gonna show that up here on the big screen, so feel free to stick around. Just as a reminder, up on the turf field, when we go up there, please, uh, we try very hard to keep it clean, as you can imagine how difficult it is to keep it clean, so no food, no drink, gum. If you're wearing your high-heeled shoes, well, take those off and walk around in your slippered feet. And I will introduce John once again. So John Bateman is going to come up again and talk about the totality, uh, how it causes a calamity for our nocturnal wildlife. He teaches many of our wildlife-related courses. It teaches students how to identify and work with wildlife. He also teaches environmental science. So once again, uh, I will see you all in a few minutes. Uh, John is back, and then we will see Tim again, and I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome intro, IZ, I appreciate that. Thank you everyone for coming. If you were here for the first time I gave this talk, please don't spoil it to those around you. Now they're also knowledgeable on how wildlife respond to uh, solar eclipses. But yeah, I'm John Bateman. I'm the resident wildlife scientist in the conservation department here. As IZ said, I teach wildlife ID, wildlife field techniques, and such. And when the request came out from the college last September, if we wanted to give a talk on how the eclipse affected something in our discipline, I was all over it. I, and it was in part just to feed my own you know, questions. I was wondering, you know, what did insects, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals do during solar eclipses? I had a hunch. I kind of had a working hypothesis uh, heading into it, and I was spot on in some areas and in others. Man, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but I'm looking forward to sharing what I learned with you all today. So, in addition to the decrease in the amount of sunlight, you know, approaching totality and then kind of resembling dawn afterwards, there are some other environmental factors uh, influenced by solar eclipses that are going to have an impact on wildlife that are experiencing this natural phenomenon. So photo period is probably the biggest, right? The, the amount of incoming solar radiation, sunlight from the sun, but also it's going to impact temperature. It's going to be an impact on wind, both wind speed and wind direction changes in humidity as we approach totality. And I know this is one everyone's keeping an eye out for today, but it can influence uh, low-lying clouds as well, so a potential increase in cloud cover. So with photo period, basically it is resembling a sunset, sorry, a sunset to a sunrise. So you have this period where sunlight is starting to diminish. It's essentially absent at twilight or at totality where it's like twilight. And then as we hit the second partial eclipse, it's almost like a sunrise again. With temperature, on average, and once again, I've, I've looked through a bunch of papers, you're looking at about a four to a 10 degree cooling, though it can be uh, greater than that. The one that went through the Carolinas back in 2017, and there was 12 to 14 degrees cooler in some of those areas. With wind speed, I found a big paper published in, in England where they had monitors set up all over the place and, and looking at what was forecasted versus what they actually had in terms of wind. And they found there was about a decrease of about a degree and a half or about a mile and a half in wind and about a change of 10 to 15 degrees more easterly. And they say it's almost like a vortex of wind underneath the moon's shadow. So this air is cooler. It's blocking out the, the moon's shadow. It's blocking out the sunlight. And you get this easterly shift. Uh, like I said, kind of almost like a backward cyclone uh, going through and following this path of totality. Uh, kind of kept compressed by the warmer air around it. With humidity, 
So cold air doesn't hold as much moisture as warm air does. So with that decrease in sunlight, we see that there's going to be an increase in humidity. And then with cloud cover, like I said, there is the potential at least for an increase in low level clouds. So I found this paper published uh, from the 2016 eclipse. This is over Indonesia, and it has four of these factors that I just talked about. And, and to me, this is, is graphed pretty well. So I added arrows. I modified this figure a little bit to show you where the first point of contact was here. At about 727 in the morning, we had totality lasted for two and a half minutes. It started at 837, ended at 840, and then the eclipse was over by 10 o'clock. So here's some of what I talked about. With temperature, we see this decrease in temperature, kind of bottoming out right before totality, and then returning. And this should more or less mirror what's going on with sunlight, right? That's what's providing the, the heat here. So we see that here's our point of first contact. You know, this is essentially sunrise up until that point. That stops, it more or less bottoms out. It doesn't hit zero at totality. It's not going to be pitch black out. It'll resemble more of you know what you would see on like a full moon because there is some scattered solar radiation coming in from around the surrounding area, plus light that's coming from the corona. Humidity, so same thing. Humidity drops as the temperature increases, but once that sun becomes obscured, we see this peak in humidity. And then after totality, it starts to drop again. And then here's that reduction in wind speed that I talked about. And like I said, it, it can be about a mile and a half. Uh, slower winds that study in Indonesia, there are actually some areas that experience about a seven uh, mile per hour decrease over there. And this blue line that we're looking at, sorry, this is more or less showing what they had the day before, just to give you an idea uh, how much variation there was that day of the eclipse. So how do wildlife respond when the amount of light is changing? So wildlife are using these day-night cycles more or less to reset like their 24-hour clock, what's called their uh, circadian rhythm. Over you know, the period of a year when you have periods of increasing sunlight like as you go through spring and then decreasing sunlight as you progress through fall as, as the days get shorter, so to speak, these are the sort of things that trigger like migration in birds. This triggers breeding in species. Uh, same thing in fall, like when we start to get those shorter days, that's when some of the medium-sized mammals, like a woodchuck, knows to fatten up that it's going to go into hibernation soon. But on a, on a shorter scale, looking at you know a 24-hour period, basically wildlife are perceiving the day more or less in like four different chunks. So they're seeing it as dawn, a period when you are going from no light, minimal light, and progressing you know, through the morning. And then we have the daytime, where we have high levels of incoming sunlight, solar radiation. Dusk, which is the opposite of dawn, where all of a sudden the day is starting to diminish, sunlight is decreasing. And then night, which is the absence of sunlight. And species have adapted to be active or be dormant during certain times of the day. And the word we use for these, or the words are crepuscular. Crepuscular organisms are gonna be active about half an hour before sunrise to about half an hour after sunrise, and then half an hour before sunset until about half an hour after sunset. So, you know, early morning, early evening. Diurnal species, these are ones that are going to be active during the day. And then nocturnal species, these are going to be active at night. And it's not like any one species fits you know, perfectly into these categories. We, we do see shifts based on uh, what's going on with breeding potentially, if they are around people or not. So black bear, which we do have, they are becoming more prevalent in this area. They're typically diurnal. But when they're around people, we see that they are crepuscular. They like to get into your garbage and your bird feeders before you wake up in the morning and around when you're going to bed or when you're having dinner at night. Uh, White-tailed deer is one where seasonally we see variations in when they're active. Springtime, they're going to be crepuscular, you know, active, once again, sunrise, sunset. Summertime, they're going to be diurnal. And then when fall hits, when, when the rut is here, essentially they're going to be active 24-7. Uh, other adaptations for this, a lot of this has to do with the eyes, and, and we're looking at vertebrates, that we have receptors on our retina that pick up color. We have cones for that, and we have ones that pick up light, and those are your rods. 
diurnal species, like people, we tend to have more rods, especially right in, you know, the, the directly in the back of your retina where you are picking up light. It's what helps us see all these vibrant colors during the day and why the colors are disappearing at night. The rods that we have are going to be more or less around the periphery, on, around the outside of those cones. So when you are stargazing at night and you may not be able to see a bright star in front of you, but all along the outside, you know, the, the, the edge of your field of view, that's where you're going to see a number of stars. The opposite is going to be true for nocturnal species. So they are going to have a greater proportion of those rods to cones. So they're relying more on that ambient moonlight and, and light from celestial bodies to help them navigate at night. So when we have an eclipse, what is going on with wildlife? How do they, once again, kind of perceive this? So from that point of first contact, when the sun hits the, the moon and you start to get an eclipse, it's basically resembling dusk. So we see that crepuscular species are going to start to become active. They think it's time to go out and find their, their food. Uh, diurnal species, for them, it's kind of the end of their day, and they are getting ready to be dormant throughout the night. And nocturnal species, this is when they're going to start to stir, and then they would, in theory, show up after you know, this, this first partial eclipse and at totality. At totality, here's where things get a bit confusing, that species perceive this as, as twilight, as, as nighttime, essentially, because there is no incoming solar radiation, no sunlight, but because it's so short-lived, you may start to see a species become active, and then it's immediately retreating. I've got a few examples uh, from what I found in the literature about some nocturnal mammals with that. And then after totality, so between that third and fourth contact point as the sun passes over the moon's shadow, it's more or less resembling dawn. So crepuscular species, they're going to start to wind down. Nocturnal species are essentially going to be inactive. But those diurnal species, the ones active during the day, that's when they're ready to get, get up and get going. So... Let me say, when I, when I did my research for this, you know, I'm not just going to like Wikipedia or Google, things like that. I'm trying to find peer-reviewed scientific literature. You know, that's the gold standard in science. Stuff that's been held up for, for review is basically deemed to be scientifically sound. With studying the eclipse, though, I, I need to put out there that we're missing two key elements to the scientific method and that we have a lack of control over variables and that we don't have repeatability. Right, so think about this in your mind, right? This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for, I'm guessing most of us in this room, it, it probably will be for me, it's going to be a once-in-a-lifetime for any of the living animals that are out there as well. When do you think we are going to have another solar eclipse totality in Canadagua on April 8th at 3-something in the afternoon? What is the likelihood of that happening, right? I, when I was looking this up, they say just, just the, the, the chance of having an eclipse at the same location is about once every 360, 375 years. And that's not guaranteed at that day or at that time. So, you know, I, I'm not saying that we just have to disregard what people said in these observations and these reports, but... Uh, like I said, it's not really held to the rigor that other science that's published is. And I, I think we need to now kind of bring in like the natural history of what species usually do during the day and then how might they have acted differently um, during the eclipse. So historical records, I've, I've, I found reports going back to the mid-1500s, right? It kind of like the, the shift from the medieval period to the modern period. Uh, reports of, you know, birds calling towards totality, birds falling out of the sky in, in, in one case. Uh, let me just say, who, who would have been recording animal observations during a solar eclipse? What kind of scientists are drawn to solar eclipses? And I don't see Dr. McConaughey in the room. I'm not trying to call him out or anything, right? It's going to be astronomers. What are the astronomers there to see? Right, This once in a lifetime for them solar eclipse. Who's reporting these animal findings? Probably the astronomer that got stuck in 100% cloud cover. And it was not a good show. So he's like, well, as long as I spent this time and I traveled to here, I might as well see if there's, there's something I can contribute. Um, and I'm not trying to knock astronomers, but how good are they with their wildlife ID? How well do they know what animals normally do during the day and that what they saw wasn't 
you know, something that's not out of the norm for them. One of the key papers that I'm going to touch on was published in 1935. It was about an eclipse that happened in 1932, not too far from here. This went through the northeast part of New Hampshire, through Maine, and then it kind of caught the northeast tip in Cape Cod of Massachusetts. And these scientists relied on citizen science, basically. They had observers uh, send in observations that, that they recorded. So if you're a scientist and you reach out to the public and you say, hey, there's a solar eclipse coming and we think that animals are going to behave differently, tell us what you saw. How many of those people do you think went in kind of ahead of time that already made up their mind that if they saw something happening with wildlife that it was probably different and that it was basically caused by the eclipse? We had a lot of that, that they, they have, you know, they make what are called a priori assumptions that they've already made up, you know, they've made their mind up ahead of time that something off is going to happen. So, like I said, historically, records dating back until the 16th century in this, this paper that I talked about from the 1932 eclipse. So this is five professors from the New England area, and prior to the eclipse, they sent out requests through newspapers and, and via radio and yeah, and see a couple of younger people in here. Uh, TV wasn't really a thing back in the 1930s, so they're advertising, like I said, in like the Boston Globe, the Boston Herald, the Christian Science Monitor, and these were like front page back in the day. Like this was this was a big deal in this in this area, and they ended up getting back more than 500 uh, observations from people throughout this this path of t totality here. Like I said, kind of you see the Vermont main border and going through Massachusetts. And I, I am big nowadays on citizen science. I, I lead a few citizen science efforts here, research at FLCC. And man, it's cool to see that they were doing this almost uh, 100 years ago. Uh, since this big paper in the 1930s, there was another paper in the 1950s, another in the 1970s on like wildlife and solar eclipses. And this really became popular with the eclipses back in 2016, 2017, numerous publications done a little more scientifically sound rather than just, you know, sending out questionnaires to those living in the zone of totality. But I'll, I'll touch on a few of those. So I'll start with insect behavior. Once again, this is, this is mostly coming from that 1930s paper because you're going to hear a species that, that live around here, things that we potentially are going to see uh, today. So talking first about activity in nocturnal species. So there were reports on cricket activity, cockroaches, katydids, moths, and mosquitoes here. So with the crickets, this is one that I have a lot of faith in. There were upwards of six dozen reports from around this region during that 1930s eclipse uh, of people basically saying that crickets started calling at the start of the that first partial eclipse and that it basically peaked at totality. This is something that I've seen again and again in this stack of other you know peer-reviewed papers dealing with animal behavior, and how it's affected by eclipses. So I, like I said, I, I think that's pretty valid. Cockroaches. I'm sure this is the last thing you want to hear about, right? But I, I, I guess I was drawn to this record that it was a, uh, a, a gentleman who was in someone's house and, and basically said, Madam, I think you have a cockroach infestation in your pantry. Uh, that basically as totality hit, like all these cockroaches started coming out from under her shelves. Uh, Katie did. We're not going to see this in, in April. This eclipse from 1932 happened in, in August. It happened about the same time of day. It was around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, this is one where they said that katydids, their calling basically peaked at totality. And then after totality, one would call here, one would call there. The observer said it was almost like they were embarrassed that they started calling at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, with moths, increased presence, and, and this is another one. I've seen this, you know, paper, you know, across paper that they are active, that the scientists will set up light traps for them and they see increased presence you know, heading into totality, uh, and it was no different here. I think they uh, named the Miller moth as, as one, and I know you don't want to hear this, definitely potential for mosquitoes. Think about this. So if, you know, when the, when the sun touches the moon and that first partial eclipse starts, the temperature goes down. The amount of light coming in goes down. We see an increase in humidity, like that's what mosquitoes like. So hopefully you have your long sleeves on today or you're willing to give up a little blood, bit of blood to these, these critters. Uh, with the diurnal species, we see an increase in activity 
uh, with the diurnal ones. Honeybees, this is one, once again, this, this really caught my fascination because these records came from apiaris, from beekeepers. Who knows bee activity, normal bee activity, better than a beekeeper? And, and once again, just dozens upon dozens of reports. So what did they say? When the eclipse started, there was like a mass retreat back to, uh, back to their hive. Uh, essentially, that the hive was basically covered with these worker bees trying to get in. And that once the eclipse started, that basically no bee was willing to leave uh, at that point. Uh, bumblebees, a close cousin to these, there was one record where basically the person says they're, they're out watching the start of the eclipse, and a bumblebee flies and, and, and strikes them and falls into the grass and essentially just lays there, did not move until totality was over and then the sun started to come out again. This is one record, right? One of something doesn't mean a whole lot in science, right? The, the more samples you have, that's when you have, you have good faith in something. But this makes sense to me because bees are actually using the sun to help them navigate. So, you know, if you're following the North Star and all of a sudden that North Star turns off, like if, if you're migrating, what do you do? Stop and wait until you see, can see it again. So it makes sense that this bee basically remained immobilized until it had that, you know, kind of waypoint to use as a, as a marker. Cicadas, once again, we're not going to see them, though I guess there's going to be a ton of these. Not too far from here with two broods emerging later this year, but basically cicadas, which call during the day that they ceased during the eclipse. And then butterflies, another diurnal species where they disappeared prior to uh, totality. And then it took about 45 minutes after the end of the eclipse for them to start going out and being active again. So amphibians and reptiles. I don't think I mentioned this at the start, but my... My branch of wildlife sciences, I'm a herpetologist. So amphibians and reptiles, like, they are my jam. Uh, notably out of this 1932 paper, and I'm trying to remember the exact words that uh, the author used, I think it was deplorable and abhorrent. The fact that we did not know what amphibians and reptiles usually did during the day at that time. Like, there was just this huge gap in the scientific literature uh, that focused on the amphibians and reptiles. So they really didn't give a whole lot of credibility to what was observed. They just stated it. Um, but as someone who has vast knowledge and background, and especially, once again, species that live you know, in this area, I, I definitely can wrap my head around this a little bit better than, than they were able to. So with frogs, they noted an increased presence of toads throughout the eclipse. Uh, there was one record of a toad basically going out and standing next to a person who was watching the event, and then after totality, that, that toad retreated. Other people talking about toads coming out in their garden, eating earthworms, eating all those crickets that were calling. Um, let me say it's not uncommon to see an American toad out during the day. This is one of the few amphibians that doesn't have to worry about drying out. So if there is any kind of overcast conditions, uh, if there are cooler temperatures and that, toads are going to be out looking for food. They noted an increase in the calling for a few species, spring peepers and tree frogs. Um, once again, tree frogs, we're not going to hear those. They don't call until around July, August. But spring peepers, I could probably go out there right now and point out a spring peeper that is calling for you. Uh, it's not really something that's going to be affected by sunlight. They're in water, and this is the time of year that they breed. It's going to be putting forth that effort trying to find a mate. Um, snakes, this is another one, kind of a mixed bag with them. The most, to me, reliable one was a zookeeper mentioning that python activity started to increase as totality approached. And these are nocturnal species, so that should make sense that the sun is starting to go down for them. They, they know that it's time for them to be active, to go out and find their food. Uh, there was an observation of a garter snake that looked like it had most had eaten a meal recently, that there was a notable bulge in its stomach, so the person assumed, oh, it must have come out and caught a frog or something during the eclipse. Uh, as someone, once again, who has studied these species and has literally stood for two hours and watched a garter snake consume, you know, an American toad. This was likely not driven by the eclipse. This was probably a process that started well before that. And then the most troubling to me was a record on a, a water snake, northern water snake, where the person said, oh, half an hour prior to the eclipse, this water snake came out and it started basking on some rocks, and it remained on those rocks until 20 minutes after the eclipse ended when I shot it. <laughs> 
Oh, persecution among uh, reptiles is, is still something that we deal with today. Uh, other reptiles, ones that aren't persecuted as much, turtles. And this is another one that it just makes sense to me. So amphibians and reptiles, these are considered, or these are, ectothermic organisms. And I guess the word that's been used for a long time that really doesn't have a use in science is cold-blooded, so to speak. Uh, these turtles are getting their heat from their environment. Morning hits, the turtle goes up on a log, its shell is alive, it is taking in that energy from the sun. That's what helps it, you know, speed, its, speed up its activity to be able to go into cold water and hunt. Basically, they saw with turtles that as totality approached, they all left their basking objects, went back into the water, and then after totality, as the second partial eclipse started, they returned to those basking objects. With insects, with amphibians, with reptiles, I'm not trying to insult them. Let's just say they don't have, you know, the, the thinky-thinky parts to the brain. They are more or less, you know, giving reflex responses to changes in their environments. If the sun is going down, they, they don't think about it. They just do. They, they, they have these changes to their behavior. We see less of that as we get into the birds and into the mammals. Speaking of birds, this is one where, to be frank, I was off way off in what I hypothesized about bird species. I figured that one species was going to respond one way and that other species were going to respond differently. And that was not the case at all, that early changes in behavior were more at the individual level, that one bird would respond differently and that it wasn't uh, across or among those different species. There were numerous, numerous contradictions in those reports that were sent to uh, those five professors leading up that 1932 study, uh, in part backing this. One thing that was consistent was that birds that were affected, if they noticed a change in their behavior, that it took longer for them to go back to what they were doing before the eclipse than birds that were not affected. And just in general, there seemed to be a sense of alarm or almost distress among a number of these, these birds. General observations, I'll get into species specifics in a minute. What we saw was a trend, or I shouldn't say what we saw. What they found was species stopped foraging, returned to roost, returned to trees, that leading up to totality, there was an increase in the amount of singing and calling happening, that there was either silence or a significant decrease in the amount of calls, songs being produced by birds. And then after totality, it almost resembled like a dawn chorus that you would hear uh, in birds, as well as the presence of a handful of nocturnal species. So with these nocturnal species, there were reports of eastern screech owls calling. There were reports of barred owls calling, reports of the eastern whippoorwill, uh, great bird mnemonic for that one, uh, calling. But once again, just a handful, not, not a, a great number of these birds. The only bird that was reported you know, in, in numerous, you know, in, in greater amounts, or at least for the nocturnal species, was the common nighthawk. And there were multiple reports of uh, just flocks of these nighthawks, but this is also you know, being August, basically when they are starting their southerly migration. So it is likely due to uh, that phenomenon rather than being caused or affected by the eclipse. For diurnal species, so those that are active during the day, uh, species that were returning to roost included American crows, European starlings, red-winged blackbirds, a lot of these we would find here, uh, house sparrow and different galls. And there were a couple notes of blue jays, which are usually very vocal, very vociferous, uh, basically shutting up and becoming, you know, going quiet when totality hit. I found this paper from the uh, 2017 eclipse. And this author, he even got this published like that year. Uh, so this is the eclipse that went from Oregon through the Carolinas. And Mendoza was in Idaho at the time. And he started keeping track of how many bird calls and songs he was getting at 10 minute intervals. As totality approached, there was actually such an increase in call volume that he had to switch to a five minute interval to keep this, this peak from kind of going exponential. But here we can see on our x-axis, this is totality. So this is leading up to totality. This is afterwards. We've got our frequency of bird calls and songs. And you can see fairly steady. And all of a sudden, we get this sharp increase. 
we get this decrease as we head to totality, and then it didn't go dead silent at totality, but you can see a, a pretty significant drop off. And then after totality, once again, when we hit that second partial eclipse, we see an increase again. I've done bird monitoring for years and years and years, um, small projects all the way up to big, like, um, binational studies funded by, whoops, sorry about that, uh, U.S. and Canadian governments. Bird monitoring usually happens in the morning, around four hours at sunset and just after sunset, or sorry, sunrise and just after sunrise, as well as four hours prior to sunset and just after sunset. Those are peak times for it. Once again, this kind of matches up with when we know that birds are going to be more vocal, or more active. With our mammals, once again, I'll kind of break this down into their normal activity levels. So looking at nocturnal species, looking at diurnal species, and then those that are on like the diurnal crepuscular side. Uh, there were reports of skunks being active. So skunks were coming from the woods, going into people's lawns, rooting around, finding grubs, insects, and that. And then basically when totality hit, they retreated back into the woodlot. Bats is something that has come up again and again and again in the papers that I looked at. Uh, bat presence, but only within the zone of totality. If you even get to 99 or 98% totality, there's no difference in uh, that bat activity. Diurnal species, one that is very, very common in the FLCC woodlot, the gray squirrel. Uh, just numerous reports of it basically ceasing to feed, kind of getting ready for night. And in one case, the person put the, you know, the words playing around it. And then with crepuscular diurnal species, I'm looking at white-tailed deer, another one that's pretty common here, that as totality approached, that these deer were making their way out of the woods and, and foraging out in fields and in apple orchards, um, once again, during totality. So in sum, I think with the insects, it's pretty reliable data. And once again, because the insect is going to have a more reflexive behavior, change in its behavior to you know, these environmental conditions, to increases in humidity, decrease in temperature, and decrease in photo period, and especially with bees, crickets, mosquitoes, like the number of reports that were sent in on these, uh, these insects, I, I think it's pretty reliable what, what I've come up with in these records. Amphibians, I think some of it's good, some of it not so much. And like I said, I think it just has to do with the lack of knowledge back in the early 1900s on, on normal amphibian behavior. Uh, but I would expect, you know, frogs to be calling anyway during the day. If other conditions are ideal out there right now and, and they look good and temperatures in the high 50s, we should hear frogs calling. I don't necessarily think that that's going to be driven by what's happening with the sun. But the turtles, this is what I'm excited about today. I am definitely going to find a spot along one of my favorite turtle ponds on campus to see if they are out basking and if there is any change in their behavior. But we need the sun for that, fingers crossed. Birds, so like I said, this is the one that, that threw me off a little bit. And uh, kind of what I've, I, I guess I've drawn this conclusion that birds are going more off an internal 24-hour clock than they are to changes in their environments. In terms of intelligence, the birds are a little bit above what the reptiles are able to do, but definitely not, you know, capable of, the, you know, the kind of the brain activity that the mammals do. So I, I think with these birds that them seeing sunset essentially in the middle of the afternoon did not match up with what their internal biological clock said. And that's why there was so much stress among those birds. And, and once again, similar to the bats, if you got outside of that 98% totality, like there was no change in bird behavior outside of that. So to me that these species were definitely being impacted, uh, their behavior by uh, the solar eclipse and totality. And then with mammals, some species are going to be more affected than others, uh, but all in all, their behavior is really not, you know, outside of what we would consider to be normal behavior. Across all of the, the studies, the papers that I read, the mammal that is most affected by the solar eclipse, look to your left, look to your right. Yes, it is the mammals. So, you know, like us, you know, one person may respond differently to an eclipse than the other. Uh, and like I said, this is kind of what we see with, with mammals and some of those birds out there. As far as today, when you're out on that turf field, 
obviously, you know, pay attention to the, the eclipse, right? Once in a lifetime event, you don't want to miss that because you thought you saw a bird out of the corner of your eye. But use your other senses, right? Use your ears and see if you can detect that increase in call frequency heading up towards totality. Let's see how quiet it gets at totality. And then when totality is over, we should hear, once again, kind of like a chorus, an increase in call and song intensity. Um, the possibility to hear some crickets, same thing, maybe not so much on the soccer field, but if you're in other parts of campus closer to the woods, I would expect to hear crickets. Once again, that's something I'm going to be keeping an ear out for today. And then changes in squirrel and deer behavior. Based on what I saw, I, I would expect that the squirrels would start to slow down, kind of get ready, thinking that it's, it's night. We have a number of other species that, if it were not April, I would be telling you to look out for. I would be telling you, look out for red fox, for striped skunk, for the Virginia possum, for the raccoon. These are crepuscular nocturnal species, but these all had their babies recently. And it is not uncommon for these to basically be out almost 24-7 trying to find food for their young. So if you happen to see a fox or a skunk or a raccoon, it's likely because of that and, and not so much because of the eclipse today. Cool. My sources? And I am happy to spend some time. I've, I've already bumped into some uh, folks that attended the talk earlier and had some great questions and, and conversation. I'm, I'm happy to make myself available if anyone wants to talk about any uh, one piece of this in particular. But thank you. Well, Thank you again, and I appreciate John and our, my colleagues coming out today to support this, this great day. So a couple of reminders. Again, my name is Izzy Grooms. I am a professor here. I do teach nutrition at FLCC. Many of you uh, will see, or, or if you see anybody with the name tag, most of us live locally. Uh, there's very few uh, that will come from far further distance. So if you need any recommendations, uh, not that we're uh, information, but if you need any recommendations about where to go, food, a park to go to, whatever you might need, don't hesitate to, to reach out and ask. A couple of things before I introduce our, our next guest, uh, Tim's going to come back, is remember... Uh, you've seen those signs that say, come early, stay late. So we've got a couple of things for you to be able to do at the end after totality. So we'll be up on the turf field from about 2.30 to 4. We still have guided uh, trail tours at 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock. Just meet downstairs at the first floor uh, of the uh, as you came in. In addition, Star Cider. Star Cider is a local cidery. Uh, CMAC is our musical venue here right on campus. And just in the far corner where CMAC is, uh, the parking lot, there is a cidery. And they will be having food and music afterwards. So feel free to, to reach out or to go there, to hang out there for a little bit. As a reminder as well, uh, for safety, when you arrived, you got your Eclipse glasses that we ordered from the Rochester Museum and Science Center. They are certified Eclipse glasses, so make sure that we uh, wear them when you are supposed to. Tim will tell us uh, of, for a very short period of time when it's safe to take them off. Other th otherwise, make sure that you leave them on until he tells us to take them off. I am going to introduce Tim to you. Uh, if you just wait two seconds, I'm going to make sure that. Well, maybe I'm going to. Maybe I'm going to tell you how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because he is coming in just a minute. So, so uh, one of the things I will tell you is uh, what, the great thing about being on this campus is. Tomorrow is what we call Laker Day. Laker Day is uh, an opportunity for colleagues, faculty, staff, and students to get together to do things outside of the classroom. So our conservation department does a whole bunch of things. 
And I mentioned to you the guided uh, trail tours. One of the great things that we do have on campus is we have uh, an excellent trail system. So having that opportunity to go on those trails is wonderful. All right, I do see Tim in the wings. So I am gonna introduce Tim and I will read his biology for those, or his little biography for those of you that had not heard me early in the morning time. Uh, Tim is a local research scientist with a doctorate in astronomy from Cornell University. He will be our guest during the total solar eclipse. Uh, Tim currently studies the atmosphere of Mars, primarily through remote sensing from spacecraft in Mars orbit and from the rovers on the Martian surface. He is a 1994 graduate of Pittsburgh Sutherland High School, which is our, one of our local high schools. He studied, the, he studied the solar corona while a student at Williams College, where he graduated in 1998 with majors in economics and astrophysics. He then worked as a research assistant for the Board of Governors of, federal, of the Federal Reserve System and as a technical staff at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory before attending graduate school at Cornell University. Tim was a NASA postdoctoral fellow at the Goddard Space Flight Center and then continued to work there as a University of Maryland research associate and assistant research assistant. He now works for the Space Science Institute and resides near Rochester. So I'd like to thank Tim. Thank you so much as always for being here and I will see you once again in a little while. Thank you. Thank you again for that very nice introduction. Bringing up my slides right now. Okay, so this talk has sort of two parts. Uh, the first is sort of an introduction to what we are going to see outside to the extent we can, given the weather. And then the next part of this talk is sort of an explanation of what we're seeing, uh, the physics, really, of what, what is, it is we're going to see in the sky. Um, so this title slide here is a composite image where someone has taken a whole bunch of photographs over time and then sort of added them together. So you see totality in the middle with the corona and then you see the moon, the, the, the sun being obscured by the moon more and more and then emerging again. Uh, this photo was taken from a spot where the sun was rising in the east, uh, but we will be seeing the sun going down uh, in the West, and you can think of what is happening as the sun is actually setting a bit faster uh, than the moon is setting. Uh, the reason for that is that the moon is orbiting the Earth in the same direction the Earth is rotating, so as seen by us, that just looks like it's setting a little bit, a little bit more slowly. Uh, so because the moon is setting more slowly, um, more and more of it, the sun basically catches up to it, and more and more of the sun is obscured until we cover the entire uh, bright part of the sun, leaving this uh, corona, um, the very outer atmosphere of the sun, uh, visible uh, between second and third contact. Second and third contact are when the moon first completely covers the sun, and then third contact is when the, the moment at which um, the moon stops covering all the sun. And first and fourth contact are when it first touches and, and, and last touches. Uh, it looks like this moment when we see the first little tiny bite out of the sun, that might be hard to spot through clouds the way things are happening now. So we really should be considering being still inside at this moment right here, which is going to be about... Um, about seven minutes after two o'clock. Uh, if we're still inside, we can actually watch the NASA live feed of totality uh, in Mexico um, instead of watching this moment, which will be very hard to spot for us. And then we have all this time, we have more than an hour to work our way outside in time for second contact. And things get kind of interesting as the sun is almost entirely obscured. Um, so. Um, it's interesting to be outside no matter what the weather is like as we get into here approaching second contact. So a little bit about the geometry of what's going on. 
uh, basically by a cosmic coincidence, um, and I mean that literally, it, it, literally, it literally is cosmic and it literally is a coincidence, uh, the moon is just the right size uh, to block the sun for a very small spot, as sort of represented by this little spot on the Earth's surface. Uh, and you can see the moon orbits in the same direction that the Earth rotates, which is why it appears to set more slowly than the sun does. Um, and another consequence of that is that the shadow, this shadow path here, moves across the Earth uh, from the west to the east, uh, which means that the total, to total eclipse happens first, in this case, for example, in Mexico, and will be happening last out towards Maine and the Maritime Provinces today. So if we look at the, look at the NASA live feed before we go out there, we'll be seeing um, the total eclipse phase as it just arrives on the, on the North American continent. And you may be wondering why this doesn't happen every month. Looks like, gee, every, time, every month the moon is, uh, is new. Why doesn't it block the sun? And the reason it doesn't happen every month is that um, the moon orbits the Earth in a different plane uh, than the sun is on. So the sun is on one plane and the moon is on a different plane. So only at a very specific time is the, is the moon in the plane of both the sun, uh, is, is the moon in the same plane as the sun, right? Because these, these planes intersect at a line, right? So we've got to be right in that line at exactly the right time. And that happens quite rarely. Um, so that's why you have to be, that's why this is a once in a lifetime experience to see a total eclipse like that. The other factor is that the moon's orbit is not a perfect circle. So sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's further away. So if the moon is too far away, even when you're in line on the same plane, you won't get a total eclipse if you're too far away. Okay, so this is the moon, this is the sun in the partial eclipse phase through a telescope. Um, so this is what we'll be seeing in clear skies um, or if you have a telescope with a filter on it, you'll see the sun being eaten up by the moon. Some important features here, this part of the sun that we normally see every day, obviously you shouldn't look at that without eclipse glasses, uh, but you could any day look at the sun. It won't have a, it won't have a, um, a bite taken out of it in most days, um, but this is what it looks like, and it, with a good telescope, a, a good but very basic telescope, you know, with a, for the proper filter on it, you can see these things here, which are sunspots, and those would become important for our story about what is happening in the sun later. Now, in good weather, and possibly even with some, some partial obscuration by clouds, uh, this is something that you should try when you're outside during the partial phase, um, is to shine the light of the sun through a, through a pinhole, and actually just a simple little hole, like in a piece of cardboard, will project an image of the sun. And basically, you're kind of teaching yourself the very basics of optics uh, by doing this, showing, showing yourself that all you need is a pinhole to make a, make a, make a picture. Um, and it also lets you monitor the progress of the eclipse. So to make you know, these four images, they had four holes. And you can even have lots and lots of holes. In this case, someone took this picture of light shining through leaves and trees, which we won't have, of course. Uh, but you can use other objects like a colander to have lots and lots of pinholes. And for every hole, you get one image of the sun. And the further away the surface is from the hole, the bigger the image will be. OK, so on to the moment itself. So. Looking at the sun through eclipse glasses, or perhaps eclipse glasses plus some clouds, um, we will see, um, shortly before totality, uh, we'll see this crescent. And then as we get very close to totality, these sort of horns are going are gonna to shrink rapidly until we have sort of like a bright point or sort of a bright bar of light uh, right on the edge of the sun there. Um, because this is such an unusual shape of bright light in the sky, um, this probably takes some very clear skies, by the way, 
um, which I don't think we'll have, but um, you can see shimmery shadows uh, on, on sort of light colored surfaces caused by this unusual shape of bright light in the sky. It's kind of like you might probably have seen shimmers on the bottom of a swimming pool um, caused by refraction of light uh, in the water. And well, in this case, refraction in the atmosphere can create shimmery shadow bands. Okay, so those horns shrink down till we get something like this. And we still do not want to try to see this with our naked eye. This is still too bright. It will still damage your retinas. Um, it shrinks down to sort of a very bright bar. Um, and at this point, people, with, people who are doing photography will be able to overexpose enough to get a picture of the corona um, while there's still some overexposed light here, creating sort of a diamond ring, to, ring effect. But the diamond ring is more, more or less a photography exercise rather than something you see with your naked eye. What we will see is this sort of that bright bar uh, right up here with our eclipse glasses. And then that bright bar will shrink further until we get these little, little dots peeking through. And these little dots, which are called Bailey's beads, are light from the sun's photosphere shining through valleys um, uh, on the limb of the moon, on the edge of the moon. Um, and this will be the last we see of the, of the photosphere uh, for the duration of the eclipse. And when you see, you should be able to see these through your eclipse glasses. When they disappear, leaving you with nothing to see in your eclipse glasses, that will be the time to take them off, although I will also be calling out uh, the time. And uh, basically, I will have a little app on my phone showing me the time, exact time, um, and giving me a little bit of little alarm when this moment arrives. And I will tell you, all right, now we're in totality. It's definitely safe to take off your glasses. And if we're having a hard time seeing the sun, um, then th th this time will be pretty helpful to know when it's actually safe in case the sun peeks out from behind clouds or something. Um, we will know that we're safe through this uh, range of time. So this is uh, the corona, the sun's outer atmosphere. Um, and I will be telling you what the corona is and why it's interesting uh, over the next 10 minutes or so of this talk. Uh, but first, this is another thing that you should be uh, keyed into, um, looking for, uh, is the whole sky is actually pretty fascinating during totality. And clouds are no, uh, unless the clouds are very thick, uh, we should have a 360 degree sunset uh, during totality. And the sky will be darkest uh, near where the sun is um, because the shadow of the moon is here. And we get sort of out to the, towards the edge of the shadow, away from the sun. So it'll be darkest here and get brighter out here. And then we'll have sunset-like skies um, all around the horizon. We also, if the sky's clear for us, um, we'll be able to see Venus. Venus will be down here, and Jupiter will be up here. It'll be very, very obvious. Uh, other stars will come out too. I think Mars and Saturn will be up there in the sky, but I suspect they'll be lost in the the brighter horizon, most likely, especially with the clouds there. Clouds there plus bright horizon, I think, will make Mars and Saturn uh, invisible today. So I mentioned Bailey's beads before. Totality will end um, with Bailey's beads appearing again. And when you see these beads appearing on the edge of the limb, that's most time to put your glasses on. Like, you'll get a, a, a fraction of a second of seeing these beads won't hurt you, but you want to put your uh, glasses on as soon as these come out. As soon as these beads come out, uh, totality is over. you got to have the glasses on. Again, I will be helping you calling that, by calling that out when we reach that time. Uh, now, another reason I want to dwell on this picture uh, of Bailey's beads, all right, it's a little different picture, but the reason I want to dwell on the moment of Bailey's beads is because at that moment, uh, we see basically all three layers of the sun's atmosphere at the same time. Bailey's beads themselves are the photosphere um, peeking out through the valleys um, on the edge of the moon. Um, and the reason, well, I'll come back to why it's called the photosphere in a minute. Um, we also see this pink glow on the edge. That is something called the chromosphere. 
uh, which is a cooler but very thin layer just above, a, just above the photosphere. And sometimes when the sun, when you have some activity on the surface of the sun, which we will definitely have right now, although I can't promise you we'll see a prominence, but there's a good chance of seeing them. Um, the uh, chromosphere, chromosphere gases can get launched um, high above the surface of the sun, which can make them visible through the entire eclipse, and that's what this thing is right here. And then this hazy stuff around the edge, which we will see for the entirety of totality, that is the photosphere, that is the, sorry, that is the uh, um, corona, which is the outer atmosphere of the sun, which is actually very important um, for the entire solar system. So let's talk about the photosphere and the chromosphere first. Ignore that blue line there. That blue line there is there by mistake. Anyway, um, so the photosphere, it's called the photosphere um, because that is where most of the photons that come to us leave from. The photosphere is still very diffuse gas. It's extremely diffuse, much, much thinner than like the air around us, much, much thinner than a cloud. Um, but there's enough of it that at some point, um, it just becomes opaque. Um, and so what we're seeing is just, uh, in the photosphere is just the, the, the location on the sun in which, the solar, which there's enough mass of gas that light doesn't really penetrate from any deeper. Light does not escape from any deeper inside the sun, and so that's why we see these, this nice sharp boundary to the sun and a distinct layer, which we call the photosphere. And then I'll talk more about these sunspots here. But let me add the Earth to scale. I don't know how you, well you can see that. I know when I made this slide on my computer, I could barely see these dots. But hopefully, on this great big screen, you can see them. So that's the sun. That's the, that's the Earth to scale. It's about the same size as this, as a sunspot. Um, and the sunspots are basically active regions in the sun's atmosphere. Um, and the active regions in the sun's atmosphere uh, and the sun's photosphere become even more prominent and dramatic active regions in the chromosphere. All these brighter areas are caused by um, what's happening in the sun's weather that produces these sunspots. Uh, this is sort of a, sort of the physics of these layers of the sun. Um, so photosphere is this sort of um, moderately warm layer where most of the photons come from. That's this. The chromosphere is a super thin layer. Um, this this from this over here. Um, it's super thin and it's cooler. Uh, and uh, what I probably should have mentioned already is that we can use different colors of ultraviolet light different wavelengths of ultraviolet light uh, to probe uh, different regions of the sun's atmosphere because gas at a specific temperature emits light at some very specific wavelengths. That's true of pretty much any gas as long as it's very diffuse gas. Uh, you'll be able to sort of pick out uh, distinct wavelengths that it emits at and you can pick out a certain temperature of gas um, in a certain layer by picking the right wavelength. So this wavelength picks out the chromosphere for us and we can see little whiffs, little wisp up here, kind of like a prominence um, on the limb. And we see it gets brighter where there's activity as represented by, represented by the sunspots. And this chromosphere is super thin. Um, I say super thin even though it's 1,000 kilometers thick, um, a little more than 1,000 kilometers thick. But remember, the, um, the Earth is like 10,000 kilometers in diameter. So the chromosphere is like smaller, narrower than the dot of my pointer. You know, there's the little thin layer around the edge here, thinner than my pointer that makes up the, the chromosphere. And it's the chromosphere that's showing us this particular color of light. And then above the chromosphere uh, is the corona, which pretty much extends out into the entire solar system. And this next slide shows us the chromosphere on the left and the corona at the right. So I've picked out three different other colors, three different colors of light, ultraviolet light, um, and sort of converted them to visible colors so we can see them, of course, on the slide. Um, and that shows you sort of the uh, garish structure of the corona 
high above the chromosphere, and it's that garish structure that is being uh, sort of wafted out into the entire solar system. So this is what we'll see today in visible light. It'll probably be spikier uh, because the sun's very active. And meanwhile, I picked out one color of light uh, from the corona. And this is what the corona, corona looks like to a space telescope that can see ultraviolet light. And you can see that all these, all the spikiness in the corona is actually, play that again. All the spikiness in the corona is actually stuff that's actively, you know, wiggling around um, and making these sort of delicate structures up above the limb of the sun. And what I showed you just here, this is just sort of ordinary everyday sun. Uh, sometimes the sun does more exciting things. Um, for example, this video here, there we go. Um, it tends to, uh, when the, there's active weather, it tends to launch material out into the solar system. So this is the space telescope, which we've sort of blocked off the sun itself so we can see the corona. Um, and when you see all those little dots appearing on our video here, that's what happens to electronics, any electronics, not just cameras, but any electronics um, uh, get pretty strongly affected by high energy atoms being blasted off the sun. So all that, all those sort of bright dots and streaks are what happens when these blasts of gas finally reach our camera. Um, and what's happening here is that the, the corona is so hot that the atoms in the corona, and so, so hot and also far enough from the sun that just the thermal motion of atoms from temperature makes some of them reach escape velocity, so they can then stream outward through the entire solar system. And then when the sun is active, it can send sort of extra density of that streaming atoms into the solar system, which is what these, you know, sort of stormy eruptions are. So why is all this activity happening in the sun? Um, it comes down to magnetic fields. And the reason there are magnetic fields in the sun is the same reason there are magnetic fields on Earth, essentially. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field uh, happens because we have a, a moving core of molten metal. In other words, we have a fluid um, that's being churned up by, um, by heat from the core of the Earth. Um, and that fluid conducts electricity. So if you have a conducted fluid that's being turned over by convection, that tends to produce a magnetic field. That's sort of a universal phenomenon in um, the physics of planets and stars, it turns out. Uh, it's not really all that well understood, uh, but dynamos, as they're called, happen all over, all over the universe um, when we can see that most stars have a magnetic field, for example. And the sun, like pretty much all stars, has a magnetic field that's produced by that churning, conducting fluid. In, in the sun's case, it's a gas instead of like molten liquid metal like on Earth. Um, so, but the strange thing the sun does is the sun is actually rotating at a different speed, at different depths. And what happens to the magnetic field as the sun rotates at different speed in different places is the magnetic field gets twisted up kind of like a rubber band that you stretch and then start twisting, right? When you twist the rubber band, it gets sort of bunched up and sort of bits of it sort of pop up and create these all, all these complicated structures of a rubber band. The magnetic field does the same thing as the rubber band when you twist it. It gets bent upwards, and where it gets bent upwards and reaches the surface of the photosphere, it inhibits uh, the flow of gas making that region cool. And because that region is cooler temperature, it looks darker, and that's a sunspot. And each sunspot, a group of sunspots, will have a, a, a north magnetic pole and a south magnetic pole in that group of sunspots. So for example, magnetic field lines will go from one part of the group to the other part of the group. 
And same thing down here. And actually, the spots have sort of opposite polarity, um, north and south. Um, sort of as you expect, because there's, there's also a sort of a north pole and a south pole to the sun, just like there's a north pole and south pole to the magnetic field of the, of the Earth. Um, and then above those sunspot groups, you get the very diffuse gas uh, combining, confining itself to the magnetic fields, creating these loop-like structures. Um, and so these loops, um, this picture here is showing us what's above this sunspot region here. And a good way to think of the structure of the corona then is the corona is gas that's being confined to magnetic field lines, just like iron filings are confined to magnetic field lines when you scatter them around a bar magnet. So when you see all these fine structures of the, of the corona, that is the shape of the magnetic field of the sun that you're looking at. Now, sometimes, um, sometimes the magnetic field of the sun can basically snap can break down just like sparks represent a breakdown of static charge or lightning represents a breakdown of static charge in the atmosphere. Um, you can also have breakdowns of the magnetic field and just like lightning, they release a whole bunch of, a whole lot of energy which can blast eruptions off the surface of the sun. Um, it can also emit lots of x-rays because they get the gas very hot. Those eruptions from the sun are called coronal mass ejections and this video that I showed you before, and I'm going to show you again, is an example of a couple coronal mass ejections happening. And um, those coronal mass ejections, um, I doubt we're going to be so lucky as to see one in action today, although it's theoretically possible. Um, those coronal mass ejections um, are very important, very important for the, whoops, sorry, it's about too fast. They're very important for the solar system um, because they tend to erode the atmospheres of planets which I sort of mentioned in my talk about Mars earlier today. Um, they also can do damage to spacecraft. All this bright spots that appear on our screen when we're taking a video of the sun, uh, they can also just sort of fry your electronics. In fact, all electronics that go into space um, are sort of special hardened versions of electronics. Otherwise, your normal electronics would not survive very long in space uh, because they would get fried by the solar activity. Uh, it can also even affect uh, Earth-based um, electrical grids because the electrical grids are very, very large. Um, uh, you can get sort of big voltages across your electric grid um, caused by solar activity. Um, so sometimes there have even, even been power outages caused by, by solar storms like this one. And the last thing, and this is my last slide, the last thing that is interesting and exciting that this, these solar uh, storms can do. Uh, and again, those solar storms are just the corona, the outer edge of the corona, and the weather in the corona reaching Earth. Um, Aurora, which we probably will have another opportunity or two to see from Rochester um, in the Rochester area, uh, can light up the sky uh, just like this. Um, this is basically charged particles streaming into the, um, into the atmosphere. And when you get lots of extra particles, um, you get lots of extra energy um, to light up the sky, uh, like so. And that is it. I think we may have some time for, yeah. for questions. Yeah. I saw this question first. Go ahead. Yeah. Isaac might be able to help answer this question. So I think. So my understanding is when we're done with our talks, am I the last talk? One more. Okay, there's one more. So after, when we're done with all our talks, I think we're putting up the live feed both here and in stage 14. Sta and in stage 14. Um, and yeah, that's probably our, I, I, I'm planning on sticking around inside rather than rushing outside to see first contact. I myself am gonna plan on watching it on the live feed because I think the weather has a good chance of being clear in Mexico. Um, and NASA will have a live feed from there. Um, so we'll probably get to see totality from there um, on a telescope. Um, and then we can go outside and experience it in person. Uh, it's not going to be as clear, probably, uh, but it's still going to get very dark. 
it'll be very interesting. The wildlife will still probably react um, to that getting very dark. And uh, who knows, anything can happen in the clouds. So it's definitely worthwhile being out there. Go ahead. Uh, the eclipse, there will be no, um, e even in a, first of all, we don't have any like solar storm or space weather event really happening now that I'm aware of. Um, and that's what it would take to really affect our electronics on Earth. And I have not heard of any space weather affecting electronics here in the ground uh, because the Earth has a magnetic field that's strong enough to mostly block all these particles. All these particles are charged, right? They're, they've been stripped of their uh, electrons, and the electrons are moving separately from the protons. Um, so they're all charged particles. They get pretty well deflected by the Earth's magnetic field, uh, except that some get funneled in, especially at the magnetic poles. Uh, and when it's very, very strong, the Earth's magnetic field gets warped enough that some of them can get to lower latitudes. But even during this event, nothing happened to anybody's cell phones. And the eclipse will do nothing special uh, for um, for charged particles reaching us. The, the, um, the, I guess there may, may be some small effects in, on the ionosphere just because we're turning off the sun for a little while, but it won't do anything special to, to, to our cell phones. The only possible effect is if you have a whole bunch of people all in the same place, that can tend to foul up your cell coverage just like a, a rock concert. All right. Thanks. Oh, one more question? Go ahead. Yeah, so that, that's because the moon is closer to us. But then wouldn't that make the shadow smaller? No, it makes the shadow bigger. Um, if you, I mean, you can play with this with a spotlight and a fist, right? The shadow. Yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah, with a, with a, with a stage light, that's probably how it works. Um, well, the sun is far enough away that I, I do know that when the sun is. Um, the way to think of it is basically do some, do some trigonometry. And the angle of um, the, the, apparent, it's the apparent size of the sun relative to the apparent size of the moon that matters. And so yes, you're right. We are, the moon is relatively close to us even for a typical, even relative to a typical total eclipse, which is why the duration is pretty long for us. Um, and that's just because being closer gives you something, gives a, a larger angular size. Um, with the sort of spotlight and obscuring thing from like the stage lights, um, that's a different geometry. And I guess I'd have to sit down with a little pencil and paper to draw that out to explain why that's different. But, but definitely for things in the sky, it's pretty much how it works. You get closer, you sort of block out, block out a larger area. Thanks, Jim. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Two o seven p.m. Our time. Our time is when totality will be happening in Mexico, uh, and the westernmost part of Mexico on the path. Um, two o seven p.m., which is totally by coincidence the same time as first contact is for us. Um, but yeah, so that'll be that'll be a time to watch it before going outside. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tim, once again. So our last round of uh, presenters, and if you've been with me since the very early morning, I had hoped that everybody would learn at least one thing today, and I think we've all can say we've learned a whole heck of a lot more than just one thing. Uh, a couple of quick little things, mobility impaired. If you are, you can just go back out to your car and swing around and you can park right up by the turf fields. We will stay in here after our humanities instructors or our professors are done because we will watch the uh, totality on the big screen in Mexico at 2.07 and then we'll all head up to the turf field. So it is my pleasure to introduce our last group of presenters. This is a, a, a group of our professors from the Humanities Department. 
We have Meg Gillio. She is uh, a professor of humanities who teaches composition one and two, introduction to creative writing as well as fiction writing workshops. We have John Palzer. John is the coordinator of the creative writing. He teaches composition literature, introductory creative writing and poetry. And last but not least, we have Maureen Mosfiri. She is professor and chair of our humanities department. She teaches foundational reading and writing courses along with creative writing. And I will see you one last time after they're done. Just a very quick turnover for the feed for totality in Mexico. Thank you again. Thank you again. <laughs> Do you mind if I shift gears from the science to the science fiction? Uh, I have a short story for you, The Daughters of the Moon. I'm going to read an excerpt. The story was written by Atalo Calvino. He's an Italian writer and journalist, and he had this story in his novel Cosmoconics, which was uh, published in 1965, and then it was republished in The New Yorker in 2009. The story begins with a scientific prologue. Deprived as it was of a covering of air to act as a protective shield, the moon itself exposed right from the start to a continual bombardment of meteorites and to the corrosive action of the sun's rays. According to Thomas Gold of Cornell University, the rocks on the moon's surface were reduced to powder through constant attrition from meteor meteorite particles. And so the story. The moon is old, Q agreed, pitted with holes, worn out. Rolling naked through the skies, it erodes and loses its flesh like a bone that's been gnawed. This is not the first time that such a thing has happened. I remember moons that were even older and more battered than this one. I've seen loads of these moons, some of them being born, running across the sky, dying out. One punctured by the hail of shooting stars, another exploding from all of its craters, and yet another oozing drops of topaz-colored sweat that evaporated immediately, then being covered by greenish clouds and reduced to a tried-up, spongy shell. What happens on the Earth when a moon dies is not easy to describe. I'll try to do it by referring to the last instance I can remember. Following a lengthy period of evolution, the Earth had more or less reached the point we are now, in other words, it had entered the phase where cars wear out more quickly than the soles of shoes. Beings that were barely human manufactured, bought, and sold things, and cities covered the continents with luminous color. These cities grew in approximately the same places as our cities do now, however different the shape of the continents. There was even an, a New York that in some way resembles the New York that you're all familiar with, but it was much newer, or rather more awash with new products, new toothbrushes. A New York with its own Manhattan that stretched out, dense with skyscrapers gleaming like the, neon, the nylon bristles of a brand new toothbrush. In this world where every object was thrown away at the slightest sign of breakage or aging or the first dent or stain and then replaced with a new and perfect stu substitute, there was just one false note, the moon. It wandered through the sky, naked, corroded, and gray, more and more alien to the world down here, a hangover from a way of being that was now outdated. Ancient expressions like full moon, half moon, last quarter moon continued to be used, but they were really only figures of speech. How could we call full a shape that was all cracks and holes and that always seemed to be on the point of crashing down on our heads in a shower of rubble? Not to mention when it was waning, it was reduced to a kind of nibbled cheese rind and it always disappeared before we 
expected it to. At each new moon, we wondered whether it would appear again. Were we hoping it would simply disappear? And when it did reappear, looking more and more like a comb that had lost its teeth, we averted our eyes with a shudder. It was a depressing sight. We went out in the crowds, our arms laden with parcels, coming and going from the big department stores that were open day and night. And while we were scanning the neon signs that climbed higher and higher up the skyscrapers and noticed and notified us constantly of new products that had been launched, we would suddenly see it advancing, pale amid those dazzling lights, slow and sick. And we could just not get it out of our heads that every new thing, each product that we had just bought could similarly wear out and deteriorate and fade away, and that then we would lose our enthusiasm for running around and buying things and working like crazy a loss that was not without consequence for industry and commerce. That's how we began to consider the problem of what to do with this counterproductive satellite. It didn't serve any purpose. It was a useless wreck. As it lost weight, it started to incline its orbit to the Earth. It was dangerous, above and beyond anything else. And the nearer it got, the more it slowed its course. We couldn't calculate the phases, even the calendar, the rhythm of the months had become a mere convention. The moon went forward in fits and starts as though it were about to collapse. On those nights of low moon, people of a more unstable temperament began to do weird things. There were always a sleepwalker edging along a parapet of a skyscraper with his arms reaching toward the moon, or a werewolf starting to howl in the middle of Times Square, or a pyromaniac setting fire to the dock warehouses. By now, these were common occurrences that no longer attracted the usual crowd of rubberneckers. But when I saw a girl sitting, completely naked, on a bench in Central Park, I had to stop. Even before I saw her, I had the feeling that something mysterious was about to happen. As I drove through Central Park at the wheel of my convertible, I felt myself bathed in a flickering light, like that of a fluorescent bulb emitting a series of livid blinking flashes before it turns on fully. The view all around me was that of a garden that had sunk in a lunar crater, the naked girl sat beside a pond, reflecting a slice of moon. I braked. For a second, I thought I recognized her. I ran out of the car toward her, but then I froze. I didn't know who she was. I just felt that I urgently had to do something for her. Everything was scattered on the grass around the bench. Her clothes, a stocking and shoe here and one there. Her earrings, necklace, bracelets, and purse, and shopping bag, the contents spilling out in a wide arc, the countless packages and goods, almost as if a creature had felt herself called back on her way from a lavish shopping spree and had dropped everything, realizing that she had to free herself of all objects and signs that bound her to the earth, and she was now waiting to be assumed into the lunar sphere. What's happening, I stammered. C can I help you? Help, she asked, her eyes staring upward. Nobody can help. Nobody can do anything. And it was clear she was talking not about herself, but about the moon. The moon was above us, a convex shape, almost crushing us, a ruined roof studded with holes like a cheese grater. Just at that moment, the animals in the zoo began to growl. Is this the end? I asked mechanically, and I myself didn't even know what I meant. She replied, it's the beginning, or something like that. She spoke almost without opening her lips. What do you mean? It's the beginning of the end, or something else is beginning? She got up and walked across the grass, 
She had long copper hair that came down over her shoulders. She was so vulnerable that I felt the need to protect her in some way, to shield her. And I moved my hands toward her as though to be ready to catch her if she fell or to ward off anything that might harm her. But my hands did not dare even graze her and always stayed a few centimeters from her skin. And as I followed her in this way, past the flower gardens, I realized that her movements were similar to mine, that she too was trying to protect something fragile, something that might fall and shatter into pieces, and that needed thus to be led toward a place where it could settle gently something that she could not touch, but could only guide by her gestures, the moon. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm going to read a handful of poems that are related to the moon, if not directly the eclipse. Um, and the first is by our current U.S. Poet Laureate, Ada Lamon. And it's not about our moon, it's about uh, Europa, the moon of Jupiter, but it's, it's got enough mooniness in it that I hope it, I hope it works. So this is In Praise of Mystery, a poem for Europa. Arching under the night sky, inky with black expansiveness, we point to the planets we know. We pin quick wishes on stars. From Earth, we read the sky as if it is an unerring book of the universe, expert and evident. Still, there are mysteries below our sky, the whale's song, the songbird singing its call in the bow of a wind-shaken tree. We are creatures of constant awe, curious at beauty, at leaf and blossom, at grief and pleasure, sun and shadow. And it is not darkness that unites us, not the cold distance of space, but the offering of water, each drop of rain, each rivulet, each pulse, each vein. O second moon, we too are made of water, of vast and beckoning seas. We too are made of wonders, of great and ordinary loves, of small invisible worlds, of a need to call out through the dark. Ada Lamon uh, just had one of her poems launched to the moon, along with several other writers and poets. And so uh, I don't know for certain if it's that poem. Um, but there is her work is resting up there somewhere in that expanse. This is Beginning by James Bright. The moon drops one or two feathers into the field. The dark wheat listens. Be still, now. There they are, the moon's young, trying their wings. Between trees, a slender woman lifts up the lovely shadow of her face. And now she steps into the air. And now she has gone, wholly, into the air. I stand alone by an elder tree. I do not dare breathe or move. I listen. The wheat leans back towards its own darkness, and I lean toward mine. Probably the only one that I have today that's directly connected to the eclipse, if only by title, The Eclipse, by Deborah Trustman. Birds nest at midday, chirp night songs in midday twilight, night without sunset, the sun noon high, bruised black by the moon. Charmed beasts dance to bells and flute, forgetting fear and fierceness, gentled bears and lions tamed for the length of a chiming, whistling tune. Strangers fall in love, a prince and a princess, parrots, planets perfectly aligned for three long minutes, as long as a song, until the sun heals white, Costumed parrots mock the wounds of magic. Strangers once more have lost the crown of the queen of false night. A 
A poem by Billy Collins, uh, a fairly popular figure in, in poetry these days. Uh, one of the poets that people who don't know anything about poetry tend to have maybe perhaps know something about. And this is Billy Collins's As If to Demonstrate an Eclipse. I pick an orange from a wicker basket and place it on the table to represent the sun. Then down at the other end, a blue and white marble becomes the earth. And nearby, I lay the little moon of an aspirin. I get a glass from a cabinet, open a bottle of wine, then I sit in a ladderback chair, a benevolent god presiding over a miniature creation myth. And I begin to sing a homemade canticle of thanks for this perfect little arrangement, for not making the earth too hot or cold, not making it spin too fast or slow, so that the grove of orange trees and the owl become possible not to mention the rolling wave, the play of clouds, geese in flight, and the Z of lightning on a dark lake. Then I fill my glass again and give thanks for the trout, the oak, and the yellow feather, singing the room full of shadows as sun and earth and moon circle one another in their impeccable orbits, and I get more and more cockeyed with gratitude. A poem by Robert Bly, who passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, for me, he was a, a crazed wizard and, and highly inspirational when I was a youngster. And so I felt like I should uh, share one of his. This is Seeing the Eclipse in Maine. It started about noon on top of Mount Batty. We were all exclaiming. Someone had a cardboard and a pin, and we all cried out when the sun appeared in tiny form on the notebook cover. It was hard to believe. The high school teacher we'd met called it a pinhole camera. People in the Renaissance loved to do that. And when the moon had passed partly through, we saw in a rock underneath a fir tray, tree dozens of crescents. Made the same way. Thousands. Even our straw hats produced a few as we moved them over the bare granite. We shared chocolate, and one man from Maine told a joke. Suns were everywhere at our feet. Next two poems are by Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath. Uh, a rough relationship of poets. One is the enemy and one is not. So this is uh, Ted Hughes's Full Moon and, and Little Frida. A cool small evening shrunk to a dog bark and the clank of a bucket, and you listening. A spider's web, tense for the dew's touch, a pail lifted, still and brimming, mirror to tempt a first star to a tremor. Cows are going home in the lane there, looping the hedges with their warm wreaths of breath, a dark river of blood, many boulders, balancing unspilled milk. Moon, you cry suddenly, moon, moon. The moon has stepped back like an artist, gazing amazed at a work that points at him amazed. And Sylvia Plath, the moon and the yew tree. This is the light of the mind cold and planetary. The trees of the mind are black. The light is blue. The grasses unload their griefs at my feet as if I were God, prickling my ankles and murmuring of their humility. Fumy, spiritous mists inhabit this place. Separated from my house by a row of headstones, I simply cannot see where there is to get to. The moon is no door. It is a face in its own right, white as a knuckle and terribly upset. It drags the sea after it like a dark crime. It is quiet with the ogape of complete despair. I live here. Twice on Sunday, the bells startle the sky, eight great tongues affirming the resurrection. At the end, they soberly bong out their names. 
The yew tree points up. It has a gothic shape. The eyes lift after it and find the moon. The moon is my mother. She is not sweet like Mary. Her blue garments unloose small bats and owls. How I would like to believe in tenderness. The face of the effigy, gentled by candles, bending on me in particular, its mild eyes. I have fallen a long way. Clouds are flowering blue and mystical over the face of the stars. Inside the church, the saints will be all blue, floating on their delicate feet over the cold pews, their hands and faces stiff with holiness. The moon sees nothing of this. She is bald and wild, and the message of the yew tree is blackness, blackness and silence. That's only going to last a few minutes, though, so don't worry. We're going to come back to a normalcy. Um, the last time I went, an hour ago, I read this, I, I started with an apology. I'm not going to apologize this time. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm of a habit to do that because I spent a lot of time in Catholic school. So, uh, This is Walt Whitman's when I, learned, when I Heard the Learned Astronomer. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I sitting heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick. Till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air, and from time to time, looked up in perfect silence at the stars. And uh, one last one. This is, uh, you're all going to know this one. This is a piece by the writer-musician Roger Waters, bass player, lead vocalist of Pink Floyd. You knew this one was coming. This is Eclipse. All that you touch and all that you see and all that you taste all you feel, and all that you love, and all that you hate, and all you distrust, all you save. And all that you give, and all that you deal, and all that you buy, beg, borrow, or steal. And all you create, and all you destroy, and all that you do, and all that you say, and all that you eat, and everyone you meet, and all that you slight, and everyone you fight, and all that is now, and all that is gone, and all that's to come, and everything under the sun is in tune, but the sun is eclipsed by the moon. Thanks. And I'm going to read <clears throat> a little bit of a great um, essay by Annie Dillard called Total Eclipse, where she describes her viewing of uh, total eclipse in Washington state in February 1979. What you see in an eclipse is entirely different from what you know. It is especially different for those of us whose grasp of astronomy is so frail that given a flashlight, a grapefruit, two oranges, and 15 years, we still could not figure out which way to set the clocks for daylight savings time. Usually it is a bit of a trick to keep your knowledge from blinding you, but during an eclipse it is easy. What you see is much more convincing than any wild-eyed theory you may know. You may read that the moon has something to do with the eclipses. I have never seen the moon yet. You do not see the moon. So near the sun, it is completely invisible as the stars are by day. What you see before your eyes is the sun going through phases. It gets narrower and narrower as the waning moon does. And like the ordinary moon, it travels alone in the simple sky. The sky is, of course, background. It does not appear to eat the sun. It is far behind the sun. The sun simply shaves, a, shaves away. Gradually, you see less sun and more sky. The sky's blue is deepening, but there was no darkness. The sun was a wide crescent, like a segment of tangerine. The wind freshened and blew steadily over the hill. Now the sky to the west deepened to indigo, a color never seen. A dark sky usually loses color. This was a saturated, deep indigo up in the air. 
I turned back to the sun. It was going. The sun was going, and the world was wrong. The grasses were wrong. They were platinum. Their every detail of stem, head, and blade shone lightless and artificially distinct is an art photographer's platinum print. This color has never been seen on earth. The hues were metallic. Their finish was matte. The hillside was a 19th century tinted photograph from which the tints had faded. My hands were silver. All the distant hills grasses were fine spun metal which the wind laid down. I was wait watching a faded color print of a movie filmed in the Middle Ages. I was standing in it by some mistake. I was standing in a movie of hillside grasses filmed in the Middle Ages. I missed my own century and the real light of day. From all the hills came screams. A piece of sky beside the crescent sun was detaching. It was a loosened circle of evening sky suddenly lighted from the back. It was an abrupt black body out of nowhere. It was a flat disk. It was almost over the sun. That is when there were screams. At once, this disk of sky slid over the sun like a lid. The sky snapped over the sun like a lens cover. The hatch in the brain slammed. Abruptly, it was dark night on the land and in the sky. In the night sky was a tiny ring of light. There was no sound. The eyes dried, the arteries drained, the lungs hushed. There was no world. Our minds were light years distant, forgetful of almost everything. Only an extraordinary act of will could recall us to our former living selves and our context in matter and time. In the sky was something that should not be there. In the black sky was a ring of light. It was a thin ring, an old thin silver wedding band, an old worn ring. It was an old wedding band in the sky or a morsel of bone. There were stars. It was all over. I have said that I heard screams. People on the hillsides, including I think myself, screamed when the black body of the moon detached from the sky and rolled over the sun. But something else was happening at that same instant that I believe made us scream. The second before the sun went out, we saw a wall of dark shadow come speeding at us. We no sooner saw it than it was upon us like thunder. It roared up the valley, it slammed the hills and knocked us out. It was the monstrous swift shadow cone of the moon. I have since read that this wave of shadow moves 18,000 miles an hour. 18,000 miles an hour. It was 195 miles wide. No end was in sight. You saw only the edge. It rolled at you across the land at 1,800 miles an hour, hauling darkness like plague. Seeing it and knowing it was coming straight for you was like feeling a slug of anesthetic shoot up your arm. If you think very fast, you may have time to think, soon it will hit my brain. You can feel the deadness race up your arm. You can feel the appalling, inhuman speed of your own blood. We saw the wall of shadow coming and screamed before it hit. When the total eclipse ended, an odd thing happened. When the sun appeared as a blinding bead on the ring's side, the eclipse was over. The black lens cover appeared again, backlighted, and slid away. At once, the yellow light made the sky blue again. The black lid dissolved and vanished. The real world, the real world began there. I remember now. We all hurried away. We were born and bored at a stroke. We rushed down the hill. We found our car. We saw the other people streaming down the hillsides. We joined the highway traffic and drove away. We never looked back. Thank you. Oh my goodness, I was a little nervous that I was gonna to have to interrupt them from finishing and I'm so glad that they finished when they did. So. Uh, we'd love for you to stick around just a few more minutes. Tim McConaughey said he would be here to uh, watch the totality at 207 in Mexico. So uh, there he is there. Uh, uh, Jeff uh, is going to come in and I believe change the feed for us to watch it. So uh, while we're waiting for him to do that, thank you so much for coming today. If you're uh, new to FLCC, you've never been here, uh, we hope you enjoyed your time. We certainly enjoyed our time uh, upstate New York isn't always, no, nowhere is promised the weather, but I am sure we'll see, still see some really great things. So um, please stay here in the auditorium uh, while the feed is changed. And 
uh, watch the totality in Mexico. All right, and thank you again. And uh, if anyone has any questions, we'll be around. I just want to add, we're definitely, I'm definitely still going outside. You know, I'll be out there by 2.30 because it will be pretty exciting out there even if we have these clouds in the way. So we'll def definitely you should be heading out there. Um, but we get sort of a, you know, and hopefully if the NASA feed does what we hope it will do, um, we uh, should get a nice, uh, cool preview of the corona. And if we don't, you can always find the live feed um, recorded and watch it later today. So. So we'll see what happens. Clips board. Whew, yeah, the countdown is on. Just a few moments left until the eclipse makes landfall in Mazatlan, Mexico. Right here, you can see where that eclipse totality shadow is right here. It's going to continue moving very rapidly onwards to Torreon, where we also have a live feed covering all of this event. Super excited for that big moment. And let me actually just go to our moon board here, and we can play through this at 60 times speed. I'll zoom in a little bit here. And Scarlett Johansson had a question a bit earlier about the kind of rippling effect that we see of the eclipse shadow. When you first see this right here, at first glance, you might think it's low resolution or we're lacking some kind of information here. The inverse is actually true. This is actually incredibly high resolution, this shadow projection that we have because of data that we've been gathering at our moon for more than 10 years, thanks to an orbiter called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's been mapping our nearest neighbor in incredible resolution just really getting every single bit of valley or crater or mountain, all of those little imperfections on the moon are contributing to that shadow that we see rippling across the country. You're not gonna be able to see that from the ground, but looking from space, you see that really cool effect of kind of the rippling there here. So let's just preview some things to come here. Mazatlan, they have that last little crescent sliver of sun. For now, if you're in that area, make sure you keep your glasses on until that sun is completely blocked out by the moon. That's gonna be in just a few moments. You're gonna have a long duration there, four minutes and 17 seconds. That sounds like a lot of time, but it's gonna move like that. So make sure you are ready on the pulse. Again, for all of our locations up on this path of totality here too, make sure you set a timer on your watch or a phone or something to remind yourself to look outside and experience this. You don't wanna miss this. If you do miss it, you got a long time to wait for the next big one across America. That's gonna be in 2045. So make sure you're watching and watching safely here. You just saw some footage from Kerrville and Cleveland as well. It's a little bit cloudy in some places, really hoping that that clears out in time for us to have that beautiful view. But in just a few moments right here, this eclipse is gonna be coming up in Mazatlan, Mexico. So for now, this is gonna be really exciting. The countdown is on. So for Mazatlan, this is the last little bit here. Again, I'm always keeping an eye on that weather. And also one little note about our tool here too. If you wanted to see this little icon kind of previews what the uh, expected uh, eclipse is gonna look like at that given time. All these little googly eye features are clickable, hyperlinkable. You can kind of click on that. It'll snap you right to that exact time to get an idea for what it's gonna look like in your neck of the woods. But for now, the big moment's coming up. Back to you, Megan, let's check it out. All right, thank you, James. And as you can see, wow, we just have a tiny little faint sliver left of the sun in Mazatlan, Mexico. We are expecting totality in a minute and 35 seconds. You know, joining us now to walk us through this, Kelly Korak, an astrophysicist with NASA's Heliophysics Division. Kelly, tell us about the science NASA is about to conduct right now in Mazatlan. So science uh, that they're going to conduct is uh, about the WB-57. So we're going to fly some planes over and make sure that we can actually see that solar corona, that uh, that those that hot atmosphere uh, that's around the sun that we're about to get once uh, we reach totality. Yeah, and it looks like uh, it's al almost there. Yes, it's almost there. Uh, you know, we have a view right now of inside the cockpit of one of the WB-57s, or at least we're efforting one, because as you said, this is going to be a huge part of what we do in Mazatlan. Definitely, yeah. It's the... Uh, oh, it's there it is, Kelly. Oh, there, there it is. is. Oh, look at that view. So we're looking oh, out. that's great. We're looking out, and it looks like we might be able to... We're seeing a lot of clouds, but hopefully a shadow as well as we're coming in to totality there. Um, and so, yeah, so these WB-57s are carrying three different instruments or three different uh, experiments, two to look at the sun and one to look at our atmosphere because our atmosphere actually responds to the eclipse. And we're trying to figure out how that ionosphere, that layer of the atmosphere actually responds to it. And you said it does look like there's already a shadow over land. You yes. know, we also have a shot, and we'd like to pull that up now, a shot of the coast and the fact that 
it's already going on over. And you know what's really cool about all of this is we do, we do have eyes all over this thing because we are collecting so much data. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we have the, the stuff here. We also have rockets on the other side of the country being launched to again study that. Oh, look at that, there's wow. the, di the diamond ring. That's right. Woo! <laughs> We're not there, but I feel the energy yeah, exactly. just watching it. Uh, yeah, so this is the because of the craters and the peaks and valleys and the moon, uh, we're seeing the last bits that are just getting through, and now we're oh, getting to wow. totality. Uh, this is great. So you're starting to see those pink fingers um, out there yes. kind of sticking out. Wow, so again, totality here in Mazatlan, Mexico, the first community in North America to experience the moon completely eclipsing the sun. And if you are in Mazatlan right now, it is now safe to remove your eclipse glasses for the next four minutes. And you mentioned some of those pink filaments that we're seeing, right? Can you talk us a little bit through that, Kelly? Yeah, so those pink filaments, um, they're, because they're helium rich, that's why they're they're appearing pink and they're they're hanging out there. Those could be the start of space weather. So there are uh, lots of tons of material, billions of tons of material that could possibly be one of those explosions for space weather, the reasons why we really study the sun and try to understand how to live with the sun. Mm. Well, you can know, you explain why space weather is important to us here on Earth? Definitely. So it's not just the satellites that need that uh, are are interested in space weather. It's also our power grids because of those energetic particles coming from those uh, those uh, big explosions that can happen in the sun. Um, that could damage our power grids. It could uh, also uh, do things like interfere with GPS signals. And I know we all use our phones to navigate everywhere. Um, so if we didn't have that, that would be a big uh, big problem. So we're uh, looking to understand it better so we can all mitigate all those things. Some of the movement we're seeing here is just or telescope operator adjusting because again they needed to make some changes for before totality now they're viewing it a different way and then after totality we might see some shakes there as well but I really just cannot believe how how crisp it is as we said it's not a marble <laughs> but I mean just the view of it is so crisp with these little uh, again those filaments are just amazing that we can see that to, to such accuracy you know right definitely and also the fu the fu white fuzz I mean that's you're seeing something that's a million degrees just wow, hanging wow out all around the sun and you know three uh what is it three million earths could fit inside of there so there's a <laughs> lot of there's a lot of atmosphere there um all around there just hanging out uh, being very warm and so how you know one of our mysteries is and one of the the b-57s are addressing there um, you go oh, wb-57 oh our pilot yep. Yeah. He's flying. So basically, Kelly, he is going to fly and try to, to, to chase down the shadow for as long as possible. Keep up with it as long as possible. Exactly. The shadow is much faster than the plane. However, they can chase it for a while and get an extra two minutes. So uh, on the ground, we can only get four and a half minutes, and they're going to get six and a half for that plane. I love that they're waving they're to waving. us. Oh, there you go. And now we're flipped. Now we're right. seeing the front. Right. So again, yeah. they are in night. I mean, yeah. it looks yeah. very dark with only some light on in, in the horizon, yeah? Right, yeah, and that's what we'll expect to uh, wherever we see totality is, is the night sky is very dark. You might even see some planets or stars. Um, and then you'll see like twilight all around in you know, 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. What an amazing vantage point as well. My gosh. Mm -hmm. I'm very jealous. Kelly, are you jealous? I kind of feel I'm like you're jealous. I'm kind of a little jealous. <laughs> yeah, I kind of want to, you know, see if I can make a faster plane so we can, you know, right. follow well, it all the whole way. Plus, they're up above the clouds, so yes. they don't have to worry, worry about the clouds. Exactly. <laughs> well, I do want to say a big thank you to the WB57 pilots and the whole team supporting them for that great view. That was awesome. Kelly, you know, you have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the sun. And, and for those watching, if you're interested in learning more with her, check out her and other experts featured in the Sun series of NASA's Curious Universe podcast. Cast, and that QR code will pop up on the screen, screen and that'll take you straight to the episodes. Again, look at that double box we got there. We're showing you amazing views during this broadcast. A big thank you, actually, to the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute, or SURVEY, for providing the telescope views from Mazatlan. Yeah, the SURVEY team down there, the SURVEY team is based out of Ames, but it is a collection of, of teams across the country and across the world that are sort of studying the, the intersection of science and exploration, helping us get ready for our next trip with humans to the moon. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, totality is actually about to end in Mazatlan. Let's keep watching our screen right now for, again, what are we watching for, Kelly? Uh, we're watching for the diamond ring effect. So that's when the first bright light, we're starting oh, to see it on the side there. Um, so you're going to put your glasses on right now to protect those beautiful eyes <laughs> um, because now we're going back to the partial phase. Whoa, so, wow. that's amazing. Wow. Yep. 
Kelly, that's a filter, by the way, everyone. That's why we're seeing <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. But yeah. when you said put on your glasses, I'm so trained now to do it that I, that I almost did it here in Cleveland. No, we're fine in Cleveland. We're still in Mazatlan. Again, what we're seeing is because we needed to adjust the filter now that, again, we are. It's basically like putting on our glasses. The way that you said people on the ground need to put on our glasses, our telescope operators need to protect their own eyes as well as their equipment. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. I really appreciate your time here with us. It was so fun to learn about the science and actually see the first eclipse come uh, for uh, North.